Section 1 of A Second Rubaiyat Miscellany This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug Section 1 Omar Khayyam or Khayyun From Fraser's Magazine, Volume 21 April 1840 Specimens of Persian Poetry by Louisa Costello One of the most remarkable of Persian poets, unprecedented in regard to the freedom of his religious opinions. The Voltaire of Persia, whose works gave great offence to the priests, but are, nevertheless, highly esteemed by general readers, apparently with justice, as the animation and brilliancy of his style are unquestionable. His hatred of hypocrisy and the tricks of false devotees appears his crime in the eyes of the supposed pious. His tolerance of other creeds was looked upon with equal suspicion and dislike. He was born at Nishapur and devoted much of his time to the study of astronomy, of which science he was a distinguished professor. But it is said that, instead of his studies leading him to the acknowledgement of the Supreme Being, they prompted his disbelief. The result of his reflections on this important subject is given in a poem of his, much celebrated under the title of Rubaiyat Omar Khayyam. He was the friend of Hassan Sabah, the founder of the sect of the Assassins, and it has been conjectured, assisted him in the establishment of his diabolical doctrine and fellowship. Some allowance must, however, be made for the prejudices of his historians, who would, of course, neglect nothing calculated to cast odium on one so inimical to their superstitions. Omar Khayyam seems particularly to direct his satire against the mysticism of Moasi, the most exalted poet of his time, though inferior in his extraordinary and incomprehensible style to the later followers of the same school, Atta and the great Mullah. However reprehensible his mockery would be, if really directed against religion in general, it scarcely deserves the severity it met with when we consider that it was the abuses he attacked and the absurdities he ridiculed, and, as for the incongruities introduced into his poems, and his professed love of pleasure, he is only following, or rather pointing out as absurd, the contradictions of the mystic poets, which are difficult enough to reconcile to the understanding, whether allegorical or not. The following will give an idea of the style of Omar Khayyam. Ye who seek for pious fame, and that light should gild your name, be this duty ne'er forgot, love your neighbour, harm him not. To thee, great spirit, I appeal, who canst the gates of truth unseal. I follow none, nor ask the way of men, who go, like me, astray. They perish, but thou canst not die, but livest to all eternity. Such is vain man's uncertain state. A little makes him base or great. One hand shall hold the Koran's scroll, the other raise the sparkling bowl. One saves, and one condemns the soul. The temple I frequent is high, a Turkish vaulted dome, the sky that spans the worlds with majesty. Not quite a Moslem in my creed, not quite a Giawa, my faith indeed may startle some who hear me say, I give my pilgrim staff away, and sell my turban for an hour of music in a fair one's bower. I'd sell the rosary for wine, though holy names around it twine, and prayers the pious make so long are turned by me to tender song. Or if a prayer I should repeat, it is at my beloved's feet. They blame me that my words are clear. I am, at least, what I appear. Nor do my acts my words belie. At least, I shun hypocrisy. It happened that but yesterday I marked a potter beating clay. The earth spoke out, Why dost thou strike? Both thou and I are born alike. Though some may sink and some may soar, We all are earth and nothing more. His verses in praise of beauty and wine 
are much admired. Guzzle Nature made me love the rose, and my hand was formed alone, thus the wine cup to enclose. Blame, then, ye, the goblet's foes, nature's fault, and not my own. When a hoary form appears, who a vase of ruby bears, call me Giaour, if then I prize all the joys of paradise. In praise of wine. Morn's first rays are glimmering, from the skies the stars are creeping. Rouse, for shame, the goblet bring, all too long thou liest sleeping. Open those Narcissus eyes, wake, be happy, and be wise. Why, ungrateful man, repine when the cup is bright with wine? All my life I've sought in vain, knowledge and content to gain. All that nature could unfold, have I in her page unrolled. All of glorious and of grand, I have sought to understand. T'was in youth my early thought, riper years no wisdom brought. Life is ebbing, sure, though slow, and I feel I nothing know. Bring the bowl, at least in this dwells no shadowed distant bliss. See, I clasp the cup, whose power yields more wisdom in an hour than whole years of study give, vainly seeking how to live. Wine disperses into air, selfish thoughts, and selfish care. Dost thou know why wine I prize? He who drinks all ill defies, and can a while throw off the thrall of self, the god we worship, all. The Vanity of Regret Nothing in this world of ours flows as we would have it flow. What avail, then, careful hours, thought and trouble, tears and woe? Through the shrouded veil of earth Life's rich colours, gleaming bright, Though in truth of little worth, Yet allure with meteor light. Life is torture or suspense, Thought is sorrow, drive it hence. With no will of mine I came, With no will depart the same. The Praises of Wine Know'st thou whence the hues are drawn, Which the tulip's leaves adorn? Tis that blood has soaked the earth where her beauties had their birth. Know'st thou why the violet's eyes gleam with dewy purple dyes? Tis the tears for love untrue bathe the banks where first she grew. If no roses bloom for me, thorns my only flowers must be. If no sun shine on my way, torches must provide my day. Let me drink as drink the wise. Pardon for our weakness lies in the cup, for heaven well knew, when I first to being sprung, I should love the rosy dew, and its praise would oft be sung. T'were impiety to say we would cast the cup away, and be votaries no more, since t'was all ordained before. The latter part of this poem seems written in ridicule of the belief in predestination, carried to so absurd a length by Mohammedans. Rilland cites these lines on the subject. That which is written must arrive, tis vain to murmur, or to strive. Give up all thought to God, for he has fixed thy doom by his decree. All good, all ill, depends on fate. The slaves of God must bear and wait. Not only as respects man does this superstition apply, but it extends to everything in nature. Sadi relates, in his Gulistan, of a fisherman who had caught a fish which his strength did not allow him to drag to shore. Fearing to be drawn into the river himself, he abandoned his line, and the fish swam away with the bait in his mouth. His companions mocked him, and he replied, What could I do? This animal escaped, because his last hour, fixed by fate, was not yet come. Fate governs all, and a fisherman cannot overcome it more than another. Nor can he catch fish, if fate is against him, even in the Tigris. The fish itself, even though dry, would not die, if it was the will of fate to preserve its life. The poet adds, O man, why shouldst thou fear? 
if thy hour is not come, in vain would thy enemy rush against thee with his lance in rest. His arms and his feet would be tied by fate, and the arrow would be turned away, though in the hands of the most expert archer. A father thus speaks to his son. Honours and riches are not the fruits of our efforts. Therefore give thyself no useless trouble. They cannot be obtained by force, and all efforts to obtain are of no more service than collyrium on the eyes of the blind. Thou mayst be a prodigy of talent, but all thy genius is of no avail, if fate is against thee. Reproach me not, and vainly say, why idly thus, from day to day, let every good pass by thy door, nor swell by industry thy store. I answer, labour, toil, and pain, prudence, wit, foresight, all is vain, travels are useless, some succeed, but others but to failure lead. Fate rules, the miser counts his heaps, and fortune crowns him while he sleeps. The Wisdom of the Supreme All we see, above, around, is but built on fairy ground. All we trust is empty shade, to deceive our reason made. Tell me not of paradise, or the beams of Huri's eyes, who the truth of tales can tell, cunning priests invent so well. He who leaves this mortal shore, quits it to return no more. In vast life's unbounded tide, they alone content may gain, who can good from ill divide, or in ignorance abide. All between is restless pain. Before thy prescience, power divine, what is this idle sense of mine? What all the learning of the schools? What sages, priests, and pedants? Fools, the world is thine. From thee it rose, by thee it ebbs, by thee it flows. Hence, worldly law, by whom is wisdom shown? The eternal knows, knows all, and he alone. End of section. Section 2 of A Second Rubiat Miscellany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omar Khayyam, the astronomer poet of Persia, by E. B. Cowell, in Calcutta Review, number 59, March 1858, pages 149 to 162. We have all read in our childhood, in some form or other, the story of the Crusades, and few names are more indelibly impressed on the memory than the Old Man of the Mountains, that mysterious potentate round whose inaccessible retreat there hung such a cloud of fable, which sober history, even in these later days, has not been wholly able to dissipate. History tries to make her lamp throw a steady gleam upon that domain of romance, and dispels some of the illusions which the ignorant awe of the Crusaders had conjured up. Thus his very name has been reduced to the well-known Sheikh, a symbol of patriarchal authority, not of years. But the imagination, after all, cannot give up the vision of the grey-haired sorcerer with his impregnable castle and gardens of delight, where the young devotee was introduced intoxicated and awoke to find himself in a fancied paradise whose image should remain in his heart for ever to nerve his arm for any enterprise which his chief might enjoin. These things may fade in the daylight of history, but to the imagination they must still hold their place, and the old man of the mountains will still stand in the background of the Crusades, the same fierce and mysterious figure to the young student of every time, which he was to the Crusaders who first heard of his name, or to the monks at home who wrote from their lips when they returned, histories of God's dealings by the Franks in his own land. It is with this old man that we have now to do, and yet how wide seems the interval between this man of blood in his mountain home and a poet of Persia. It is indeed a strange piece of forgotten history which thus joins two such different characters and leads us to the spot where the two streams still flowed side by side which were fated hereafter to diverge so far. 
In the middle of the 11th century, some 25 years before the Norman won the broad lands of the Saxon, a great revolution took place in the east. The iconoclast Mahmud of Ghazni had left his kingdom in a successor's feebler grasp, and the fierce Tartar tribes, which roamed beyond the Oxus, in that officina gentium of the east, had risen against his authority, and had driven him, an exile, southwards beyond the Hindu Kush. The sceptre of Persia thus passed to the invading chief, who, under the name of Togrul Beg, established the Seljukian dynasty, a memorable name amid the shadows which chased one another so rapidly across the scene of Oriental history. It was the Seljukides who caused the Crusades. The caliphs of Baghdad and Egypt and their provincial vice-regents had found it to their interest to protect the pilgrims of the West as they flocked to the holy city, and they had held undisputed possession of Palestine, the frank stranger might mourn that Omar's mosque stood on Mount Moriah, but he thankfully paid his pilgrim tax and returned in peace to his home. But the Turkish conquerors knew nothing of the advantages of interchange and commerce. Their only law was the sword. From the hour of their rise, the pilgrims were crushed by their oppression and returned to their several lands with dismal tales of Turkish license and cruelty. They did not complain in vain. A nerve was touched of exquisite feeling, and the sensation vibrated to the heart of Europe. But the Crusades were still future at the time when our narrative opens. Alp Arslan, or Alp the Lion, was on the throne of his father Togrul Beg, in every respect the Coeur de Lion of Eastern story, when three youths were studying together under the great doctor of Islam, Moafak of Neshapur. One of them has left his own account so that we would tell it in his own words. One of the greatest of the wise men of Khorasan was the Imam Moafak of Neishapur, a man highly honoured and reverenced. May God rejoice his soul. His illustrious years exceeded eighty-five, and it was the universal belief that every boy who read the Koran or studied the traditions in his presence would assuredly attain to honour and happiness. For this cause did my father send me from Tus to Neishapur with Abdu Samad, the doctor of law, that I might employ myself in study and learning under the guidance of that illustrious teacher. Towards me he ever turned an eye of favour and kindness, and, as his pupil, I felt for him extreme affection and devotion, so that I passed four years in his service. When I first came there, I found two other pupils of mine own age newly arrived, Hakim Omar Kayam and the ill-fated Ben Sabah. Both were endowed with sharpness of wit and the highest natural powers, and we three formed a close friendship together. When the Imam rose from his lectures, they used to join me, and we repeated to each other the lessons we had heard. Now, Omar was a native of Neshapur, while Hassan Ben Sabah's father was one Ali, a man of austere life and practice, but heretical in his creed and doctrine. He had long sojourned in the province of Bray, where Abu Moslim Razi was governor, a man of pure life and orthodox principles, who, like a good Mussulman as he was, showed deep enmity to such an heretic. But Ali still kept close at his side, and, by lying oaths and protestations, sought to clear himself from the insane words and actions laid to his charge. Now, the Imam Moafak was followed as an example by all orthodox Mussulmans. So this unhappy man, to remove all suspicion of his heresies, brought his son to Neshapur and made him attend the lectures of the Imam. He himself chose a life of asceticism in a cloister. But even while there, men rumoured speeches of heresy that he had uttered, sometimes of one kind and sometimes of another. But to my story, one day Hassan said to me and to Kayam, it is a universal belief that the pupils of the Imam Moafak will attain to fortune. Now, even if we all do not attain thereto, without doubt one of us will, what then shall be our mutual pledge and bond? We answered, Be it what you please. Well, he said, let us make a vow that to whomsoever this fortune falls, he shall share it equally with the rest, 
and reserved no preeminence for himself. Be it so, we both replied, and on these terms we mutually pledged our words. Years rolled on, and I went from Khorasan to Transoxiana, and wandered to Ghazni and Kabul. And when I returned, I was invested with office, and rose to be administrator of affairs during the Sultanate of Sultan Alp Ashlan. Such is the narrative of Nizam ul Mulk, the famous vizier of Alp Ashlan, and of his son and successor Malik Shah, who gives this story of his youth in his political will, Vasiya Nizam ul Mulk, that is, Testamentum Politicum, which he wrote in his old age as a manual to future statesmen. He goes on to state that years passed by, and both his old school friends found him out and came and claimed a share in his good fortune, according to the school day vow. The vizier was generous and kept his word. Hassan demanded a place in the government, which the sultan granted at the vizier's request. But, discontented with the gradual rise, he plunged into the maze of intrigue of an oriental court, and, failing in a base attempt to supplant his benefactor, he was disgraced and fell. His subsequent adventures are one of the romances of oriental history. After many mishaps and wanderings, he became the head of the Persian sect of the Ismailians, a party of fanatics who had long murmured in obscurity, but rose to an evil eminence under the guidance of his strong and evil will. In A.D. 1090, he seized the castle of Alamut in the province of Rudbar, which lies in the mountainous tract south of the Caspian Sea. Here he fixed his stronghold, and it was from this mountain home that the sheikh obtained that evil celebrity among the crusaders as the old man of the mountains. From Alamut issued those fierce fanatics who, in blind devotion to their chief's commands, spread terror through the Mohammedan world and it is yet disputed whether the word assassin, which they have left in the language of modern Europe, as their dark memorial, is derived from the hashish, or opiate of hemp leaves, the Indian bung, with which they maddened themselves to the sullen pitch of oriental desperation, or from the name of the founder of the dynasty, whom we have seen in his quiet collegiate days at Naishapur. To complete the picture, we need only add that one of the countless victims of the assassin's dagger was Nizam ul Mulk himself, the old schoolboy friend. Omar Khayyam also came to the vizier to claim his share, but not to ask for title or office. The greatest boon you can confer on me, he said, is to let me live in a corner under the shadow of your fortune, to spread wide the advantages of science, and pray for your long life and prosperity. The vizier tells us, that, when he found that he was really sincere in his refusal, he pressed him no further, but granted him a yearly pension of 1,200 mithkils of gold from the treasury of Naishapur. At Naishapur thus lived and died Omar Khayyam, the poet-astronomer of Persia, busied, adds the vizier, in winning knowledge of every kind, and especially in astronomy, wherein he attained to a very high preeminence. Under the Sultanate of Malik Shah, he came to Merv and obtained great praise for his proficiency in science, and the Sultan showered favours upon him. Of Omar's attainments as an astronomer, we have ample proof. When Malik Shah determined to reform the calendar, he was one of the eight learned men employed to do it, and the result was the Jalali era, so called from the Jalal ul Din, one of the king's names. A computation of time, says Gibbon, which surpasses the Julian and approaches the accuracy of the Gregorian style. He is also the author of some astronomical tables, entitled Zidji Malik Shai, and we have placed at the head of our article a treatise of his on algebra, which has been lately translated and published in Europe. Of the particular incidents of his life, we know little enough, but probably there was little to know. A life like his, spent in quiet toil, and hiving knowledge with each studious year, leaves little for the chronicler to record. His Takalus, or poetical name, Kayam, signifies a tent-maker, and he is said to have at one time exercised that trade, perhaps before Nizam ul Mulk's generosity raised him to independence. Many Persian poets similarly derive their names from their occupations. Thus we have Attar, a druggist, 
Asar, an oil presser, etc. Omar himself alludes to his name in the following whimsical lines. Kayam, who stitched the tents of science, has fallen in grief's furnace and been suddenly burned. The shears of fate have cut the tent ropes of his life, and the broker of hope has sold him for nothing. We have only one more anecdote to give, and that relates to the close, and then we shall turn from Omar, the mathematician, to the more interesting character, Omar the poet. The following incident is given in the anonymous preface, which is sometimes prefixed to his poems. It has been printed in the Persian in the appendix to Hyde's Veterum Persarum Religio, page 499, and Derbalot alludes to it in his Bibliothèque under Qiyam. It is written in the Chronicles of the Ancients that this king of the wise, Omar Khayyam, died at Neshapur in the year of the Hegira 517, A.D. 1123. In science he was unrivalled, the very paragon of his age. Kawaj Nizami of Samarkand, who was one of his pupils, relates the following story. I often used to hold conversations with my teacher, Omar Khayyam, in a garden. And one day he said to me, My tomb shall be in a spot where the north wind may scatter roses over it. I wondered at the words he spake, but I knew that his were no idle words. Years after, when I chanced to revisit Naishapur, I went to his final resting place. And lo, it was just outside a garden, and trees laden with fruit stretched their boughs over the garden wall and dropped their flowers upon his tomb so that the stone was hidden under them. A grave fit for the poet, and to his poems we now turn. Omar Khayyam's poems are unique in the literary history of the world. It is not often that a great mathematician indulges in a relaxation of verse. One remembers Sir Isaac Newton's scorn of spoilt prose, and is apt to think of Urania as somewhat shy of familiar intercourse with her sisters. But in Omar, we have not only an example of the perfect compatibility of the severest studies in the exact sciences, with that play of fancy and delicacy of feeling which we associate with the poet. This is by no means all the marvel. We find, in his verses, a totally different character to that which we should have naturally expected from the prevailing habit of thought in which he lived. Our double-natured poet is a Janus, whose two heads bear no similarity, the one half of his life in experience, contradicts the other. Was it that the melancholy temperament, which Aristotle of old attributed to all poets and mathematicians, being thus doubled in intensity by this twofold liability, found its full utterance in these bitter tetristics, turning for a while from its exact and abstract studies with all their unreal truth, distant but distant, clear but oh, how cold, only to find in life and time enigmas still more puzzling and problems still more indeterminate, and uttering in these lines its sullen protest of weariness? From the centre of earth to the zenith of Saturn, I solved all the problems of the heavens. I leapt forth from the bonds of every snare and deceit, and every bond was unloosed, except the bond of death. Every other poet of Persia has written too much. Even her noblest sons of genius weary with their prolixity. The language has a fatal facility of rhyme, which makes it easier to write in verse than in prose, and every author heaps volumes on volumes until he buries himself and his reader beneath their weight. Our mathematician is the one solitary exception. He has left fewer lines than grey. This little volume of tetra sticks, be their real number what they may, occupies its own niche in Persian literature. Footnote. The only two manuscripts which we have seen are number 140 in the Oosley collection in the Bodleian Library, a very beautiful manuscript written at Shiraz, Anohegira, 865, AD 1460. This contains only 158 tetra sticks, and number 1548 in the Asiatic Society, Calcutta, which probably wants a leaf or two at the end, and is negligently transcribed. This contains 516. Von Hammer, in his Geschichte der schönen Redekünste Persiens, 
speaks of his own manuscript as containing about 200. The Lucknow manuscript, mentioned in Dr. Sprenger's catalogue, contains 408. Since this paper was written, we have met with a copy of a very rare edition, printed at Calcutta, A.H. 1252, A.D. 1836. This contains 438 tetra sticks, with an appendix containing 54 others, not found in some manuscripts, 492 in all. End footnote. For terseness of expression and vigour of thought, we know of no epigrams like them, even in the Greek anthology. While for passionate earnestness and concentrated sadness, there is nothing equal to them except Lucretius. The Epicurean views which pervade them, but add a deeper gloom to the melancholy, we know that the gaiety is unreal, and the poet's smile is but a risus sardonicus of despair. All things whisper in his ear of change and decay. The sad refrain rings ever in his hearing. Everywhere in the world he reads the record of the inscription which Solomon, in Eastern story, gave for a signet ring, when one asked him for a motto, which should suit alike prosperity and adversity. This also shall pass away. Since life is all passing, what matter Baghdad or bulk? If our cup be full, what matter bitter or sweet? Drink wine, for long after thee and me, yon moon will still fill to its full, and still waste to its wane. Or this, yon rolling heaven for our destruction, yours and mine, aims its stroke at our lives, yours and mine. Come, love, sit on the grass, it will not be long ere grass grows out of our dust, yours and mine. This law, if one might call it so, of corporeal transmigration occurs again and again in his poems. It seems to jar on the poet's inmost soul and give him a peculiar pang. Elsewhere he has it in a more general shape. Wheresoever is rose or tulip bed, its redness comes from the blood of kings. Every violet stalk that springs from the earth was once a mole on a loved one's cheek. In this form, the thought is not peculiar to the East. We find a very similar passage in one of Shelley's poems. There's not one atom of yon earth but once was living man, nor the minutest drop of rain that hangeth in its thinnest cloud, but flowed in human vein. We will add one more of this class of tetrastics before we pass on to others. In this, there is a peculiar delicacy of touch, which softens the roughness of the original thought. This flask was once a poor lover like me, all immersed in the chase of a fair face, and this, its handle, you see on its neck, was once a hand that clasped a beloved. The extracts, which we have already quoted, will give our readers an idea of Omar's poetry, and perhaps they will, ere this, have recognised one of its peculiar features. Omar lived in an age of poetical mysticism, but he himself is no mystic. His exact sciences kept him from the vague dreams of his contemporaries. He never loses himself in the one and the all. He plants his foot on the terra firma of today and builds on it as if it were rock and not a quicksand. Sweet blows on the rose's face the breeze of the new spring. Sweet down in the garden are the faces of the heart in flamers. But naught is sweet that thou canst tell of a yesterday past. Come, be glad, nor talk of yesterday. Today is so sweet. But Omar, for all his insight, had not made the wiser choice. The mysticism, in which the better spirits of Persia loved to lose themselves, was a higher thing, after all, than his keen worldliness, because this was but of the earth, and bounded by the earth's narrow span, while that, albeit an error, was a groping after the divine. There was a depth in that vague mysticism which Omar's science had never sounded. It sprang from wants and feelings to which his own heart was a stranger. And hence, though his poetry was real and full of passion, it moved cabined, cribbed, confined, in the animal life of the senses, and seems dazzled at any prospect beyond the grave. 
His very ideas of death seem confined to the body. He can feel, like Keats, the flowers growing over him, but he rarely looks or thinks beyond. And yet it is not always so. A few rare tetrastics testify that Omar could not always prove a traitor to his own genius, that, sometimes, it overmastered his habits, and wrung unwonted aspirations perforce from his lips. O heart, wert thou pure from the body's dust, thou shouldst soar naked spirit above the sky. Highest heaven is thy native seat. For shame, for shame that thou shouldst stoop to dwell in a city of clay. No wonder that gloom overshadows all Omar Khayyam's poetry. He was false to his better self, and therefore ill at ease and sad. He was resolved to ignore the future and the spiritual, and anchor only by the material and tangible. But his very insight became blinded and misled him, and instead of something solid and satisfying, he grasped only a darkness that could be felt. We can trace the evil running like a canker through his life, his pleasures, his friendships, nay, his very studies became blighted under its touch. Bernoulli could find such an intense delight in his problems that he could say that they gave him some idea of the happiness of heaven. His faculties were working unrestrained towards their proper object, and pleasure, old philosophers tell us, supervenes on such harmonious action as a finish or bloom. But in Omar there was no such internal harmony. The diviner part within him was ignored, and hence the very studies in which his life was spent failed to yield him solid enjoyment. Had he been only a thoughtless Epicurean, we should have looked at his poetry in a very different light. The careless gaiety of Horace never loses its charm, for it was the spontaneous outburst of his nature. He floated on life's surface, with no deep passion for anything, and his poetry bears the true impress of his character. But in Omar there was a resolute will. He was deeply earnest in science, and to dally with doubt and Epicureanism was possible only when he was not in earnest. It was this which caused the mortal jar in his character, and hence his poetry reads to us like sweet bells jangled, out of tune and harsh. We have said that Omar was no mystic. We find no trace of Sufism in his book. His roses bloom in an earthly summer. His wine is of mortal vintage. Unlike all other Persian poets, everything with him is real and concrete. That tone of revelry which in Hafez and Jami was but a passing fashion under which their genius veiled its higher aspirations, like the Petrarchan sonnet in the hands of Shakespeare or Milton, is, in Omar Khayyam, the matter itself, not the form. He turns in these quatrains from his science and astronomy to drown thought in the passing moment's pleasures. He seems to forget his better self in his temporary Epicurean disguise. My coming was not of mine own design, and one day I must go, and no choice of mine. Come, light-handed cupbearer, gird thee to serve. We must wash down the care of this world with wine. Come, bring me that ruby in yon crystal cup, that true friend and brother of every open heart. Thou knowest too well that this life on earth is a wind that hurries by. Bring the wine. Since none can promise himself to-morrow, make that forlorn heart of thine glad to-day. Drink wine, fair moon-faced, by the light of yon moon, for oft shall it look for us, and find us not. What, though the wine rends my veil? While I live, I will never tear me away. I marvel much at the sellers of wine, for what better thing can they buy than what they sell? The caravan of life hurries strangely by, sees every moment that passes in joy. Why, cupbearer, mourn for the morrow of thy friends? Give the cup of wine, for the night hurries by. A few of the tetristics breathe the same spirit of contentment which we should have expected from their author's old reply to the vizier's invitations to power. Some ruby wine and a divan of poems, 
a crust of bread to keep the breath in one's body, and thou and I, alone in a desert, were a lot beyond the sultan's throne. Of all the world my choice is two crusts and a corner. I have severed my desires from power and its pomp. I have bought me poverty with heart and soul, for I have found the true riches in poverty. O oh, my heart, since life's reality is illusion, why vex thyself with its sorrows and cares? Commit thee to fate, contented with the hour, for the pen, once passed, returns not back for thee. But in too many of his poems we find a settled gloom, which stands in striking contrast to the assumed carelessness. Omar is ill at ease within, and his internal discord reflects itself in an angry defiance of the world and its opinions and beliefs. Like the Roman Lucretius, his very science leads him astray. He has learned enough to unsettle his ancient instincts, but not enough to rebuild them on a surer basis. In the sublime poem of Lucretius, we see the inevitable battle between the vague dreams of an obsolete pathology and the progressive certainties of physical science. And in the first intensity of the conflict, the iconoclasm extends itself beyond the idols of the old belief to the very bases of belief itself within the soul. The arbitrary laws and tenets of the national creed are found at variance with the discoveries of science. The idea of laws of nature slowly evolves itself in its sublime simplicity and universality, and the idle causes of phenomena which mythology had fabricated in the personal caprices of certain deified abstractions melt away of themselves like shadows in the light of morning. But under all these erroneous figments there lay the primitive instinct of some first cause, the obstinate unconquerable want which no created thing can fill. And this remained untouched amidst the change, as the soul when the body is shattered. But this Lucretius did not understand. He proceeded from the gods of mythology to demolish the very idea of a providence at all. The very truth which he had grasped so firmly that nature obeys certain unvarying laws led him astray. And it was a step reserved for a later time to see that this grand idea is by no means at variance with the ancient instincts of the soul. That the laws of nature, like any other laws, must imply a lawgiver's sanction and authority, and that long before Greek or Roman science, in an unlettered people, whose very name Greece and Rome despised, ancient seers had recognised the scientific principle, and yet at once subordinated it to the highest truth, when they sang of man's impotence to break God's covenant of the day and of the night, that there should not be day and night in their season. Footnote. The word covenant, berith, occurs several times in Scripture to express the laws which God has imposed on nature, and in Jeremiah, chapter 33, verse 25, we have the word ordinances, hukoth, used in the same sense. Compare the prayer book version of Psalm 148, line 6. He hath given them a law which shall not be broken. It is singular that Lucretius uses the word phodis in the same sense, though his atheism deprives the phrase of its real significance. End footnote. Omar Khayyam's scepticism seems to us to belong to a similar phase of mental history with that of Lucretius. He lived in an age and country of religious darkness, and the very men around him, who most felt their wants and misery, had no power to satisfy or remove them. Amidst the religious feeling, which might be at work, acting in various and arbitrary directions, hypocrisy and worldliness widely mingled, and everywhere pressed the unrecognised, but yet overmastering reality, that the national creed was itself not based on the eternal relations of things as fixed by the Creator. The religious fervour, therefore, when it betook itself to its natural channel to flow in, the religion of the people, found nothing to give it sure satisfaction. The internal void remained unfilled. Hence this fervour naturally turned to asceticism and mysticism. The dervishes, fakirs, and sufis of the Mohammedan world 
have risen by a law of the human mind, and we think that the scepticism of Omar Khayyam and similar writers is but the result of another similar law. The asceticism and mysticism failed in their turn to give solid peace to the inquirer, and they were soon overlaid by mummeries and deceits. The earnest enthusiasts died, and their places were too often filled by impostors. And Omar Khayyam is the result of the inevitable reaction. His tetristics are filled with bitter satires of the sensuality and hypocrisy of the pretenders to sanctity. But he did not stop there. He could see, with a clear eye, the evil and folly of the charlatans and empirics. But he was blind, when he turned from these, to deny the existence of the soul's disease, or at any rate, the possibility of a cure. Here, like Lucretius, he cut himself loose from facts, and in both alike we trace the unsatisfied instincts, the dim conviction that their wisdom is folly, which reflect themselves in darker colours in the misanthropy and despair which cloud their visions of life. Lucretius, when he resolved to follow his material science to the last, whithersoever it should lead him, built a system for himself in his poem, or rather acted as the exponent and interpreter of the Greek system which he had embraced. His poem on nature has a professed practical aim, to explain the world's self-acting machine to the polytheist, and to disabuse him of all spiritual ideas. Omar Khayyam builds no system. He contents himself with doubts and conjectures. He loves to balance antitheses of belief and settle himself in the equipoise of the sceptic, epochi. Fate and free will, with all their infinite ramifications and practical consequences, the origin of evil, the difficulties of evidence, the immortality of the soul, future retribution, all these questions recur again and again. Not that he throws any new light upon these world-old problems, he only puts them in a tangible form, condensing all the bitterness in an epigram. Of this class we subjoin two of the more harmless. Some of the most daring are better left in their original Persian. I am not the man to fear annihilation, that half forsooth is sweeter than this half which we have. This life of mine is entrusted as a loan, and when payday comes, I will give it back. Heaven derived no profit from my coming hither, and its glory is not increased by my going hence, nor hath mine ear ever heard from mortal man this coming and going, why they are at all. The Domar, in his impiety, was false to his better knowledge, we may readily admit, while, at the same time, we may find some excuse for his errors, if we remember the state of the world at that time. His clear strong sense revolted from the prevailing mysticism, where all the earnest spirits of his age found their refuge, and his honest independence was equally shocked by the hypocrites who aped their fervour and enthusiasm, and, at that dark hour of man's history, whither, out of Islam, was the thoughtful Mohammedan to repair. No missionary's step, bringing good tidings, had appeared on the mountains of Persia. The few Christians who might cross his path in his native land would only seem to him idolaters. And even in Europe itself, Christianity lay stifled under an incubus of ignorance and superstition. Christendom came before Omar only in the form of the First Crusade, these things should be borne in mind as we study Mohammedan literature. While Arabian and Persian letters were in their glory, Europe was buried in medieval darkness. Science and learning were in their noontide splendour in Baghdad and Cordova, while feudal barbarism brooded over France and England. When we read such a life as Sadi's, with its thirty years of adventure and travel, it is strange to mark how entirely the range of his experience is confined to Asia and the Mohammedan world. Almost the only one point of contact with Christendom is his slavery under the Crusaders at Tripoli. The same isolation runs through all the golden period of Persian literature. It was already fast fading into tasteless effeminacy when the two Shirleys first found their way to the court of Abbas the Great. We now proceed to add a few of the more striking tetristics. 
they will serve as further proofs of what we have remarked on the author's singular position among the poets of his country. None that we know of has written fewer lines, and in none is there so large a proportion of good. The spring cloud came and wept bitterly above the grass. I cannot live without the argivan coloured wine. This grass is our festal place today, but the grass that grows from our dust, whose festal place will it be? Ask not for empire, for life is a moment. Every atom of dust was once a kaikobud or jamshid. The story of the world, and this whole life of ours, is a dream and a vision, an illusion and a breath. When the nightingale raises his lament in the garden, we must seize, like the tulip, the wine in our hand, ere men, one to the other, in their foolish talk, say, Such an one hath seized his cup, and is gone. That castle, in whose hall King Bahram drained the cup, there the fox hath brought forth her young, and the lion made his lair. Bahram, who his life long seized the deer, Gore, see how the tomb, Gore, has seized him to-day. By the running stream and the grass, cup-bearer bright as the lamp, give the wine, break thy vows, and touch the lute. Be glad, for the running stream lifts its voice. I am gone, it cries, and shall never return. Alas that the book of youth is folded, and the fresh purple spring become December, that bird of joy, whose name was youth. Alas, I know not how he came or is gone. Be glad, for the moon of the Eid will be here. All the means of mirth will soon be well. Pale is yon moon, its back bowed and lean. You would say it will soon sink in its sorrow. Lip to lip I passionately kiss the bowl to learn from it the secret of length of days. Lip to lip, in answer, it whispered reply. Drink wine, for once gone, thou shalt never return. I went last night into a potter's shop. A thousand pots did I see there, noisy and silent, when suddenly one of the pots raised a cry, Where is the pot-maker, the pot-buyer, the pot-seller? In the view of reality, not of illusion, we mortals are chessmen, and fate is the player. We each act our game on the board of life, and then, one by one, are swept into the box. Yon rolling heavens, at which we gaze bewildered, are but the image of a magic lanthorn. The sun is the candle, the world the shade, and we the images which flit therein. Footnote The Phanos i Kial is explained as a lanthorn, which revolves by the smoke of the candle within, and has on the sides of it figures of various animals. These lanthorns are very common in Calcutta. They are made of a talc cylinder, with figures of men and animals cut out of paper and pasted on it. The cylinder, which is very light, is suspended on an axis, round which it easily turns. A hole is cut near the bottom, and the part cut out is fixed at an angle to the cylinder, so as to form a vein. When a small lamp or candle is placed inside, a current of air is produced, which keeps the cylinder slowly revolving. End footnote. Last night I dashed my clay cup on the stone, and at the reckless freak my heart was glad, when, with a voice for the moment, out spake the cup, I was once as thou, and thou shalt be as I. We would conclude with two more tetra sticks which may fitly close our imperfect sketch. Omar Khayyam, we have said, was ill at ease and unhappy. His tone of revelry and enjoyment vainly masked the aching void within. And where shall we find a more melancholy dirge than the following over a wasted life, with all its knowledge and genius? If coming had been in my power, I would not have come. If going had been in my power, I would not go. O oh, best of all lots, if in this world of clay I had come not, nor gone, nor been at all. And if the present was dark, darker still seemed the future. Its darkness made even the present seem bright. Ere death raises his night attack on thy head, 
bid them bring the rose red wine no gold art thou poor brainsick fool that once buried they should dig thee out again how different from the feeling of good old isaac walton when he stood by the open grave of his friend dr dunn and thought of that body which once was a temple of the holy ghost and is now become a small quantity of christian dust but i shall see it reanimated end of section section three of a second rubaiyat miscellany this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some more of Omar's Quatrains by Whitley Stokes 1. Death I dashed my clay cup on the stone hard by. The reckless frolic raised my heart on high. Then said a shard with momentary voice, As thou have I been, thou shalt be as I. Annihilation makes me not to fear. In truth, it seems more sweet than lingering here. My life was sent me as a loan unsought. When payday comes, I'll pay without a tear. Has God made profit from my coming? Nay. His glory gains not when I go away. Mine ear has never heard from mortal man this coming and this going. Why are they? I'd not have come had this been left to me, nor would I go, to go if I were free. Oh, best of all, upon this lonely earth, neither to come nor go, yes, not to be. Oh, that there were some place where men could rest, some end to look for in this lonely quest, some hope that in a hundred thousand years our dust might blossom on the mother's breast. Alas for me, the book of youth is read. The fresh glad spring is now December dead. That bird of joy, whose name with youth is flown. Ay me, I know not how he came or fled. 2. God Thou art the opener, open thou the door. Thou art the teacher, teach my soul to soar. No human masters hold me by the hand. They pass away. Thou abidest evermore. I cannot reach the road to join with thee. I cannot bear one breath apart from thee. I dare not tell this grief to any man. Ah, hard. Ah, strange. Ah, longing sweet for thee. 3. Conduct In school and cloister, mosque and fane one lies a dread of hell or dreams of paradise but none that know the secrets of the lord have sown their hearts with such like fantasy ah strive amain no human heart to wring let no one feel thine anger burn or sting wouldst thou be lapped in long enduring joy know how to suffer cause no suffering while sinew vein and bone together blend Outside the path of doom we cannot wend. Bow not thy neck, though Rustum be thy foe. Be bound to none, though Hatim be thy friend. 4. Consolation This is the time for roses and repose beside the stream that by the meadow goes. A friend or two, a sweetheart like a rose, with wine, and none to heed how Muller's prose. Come, bring that ruby in yon crystal bowl, that brother true of every open soul. Thou knowest over well this life of ours is wind that hurries by. Oh, bring the bowl. With loving lip to lip the bowl I drain, to learn how long my soul must here remain. And lip to lip it whispers, While you live, drink, for once gone, you come not back again. Sweet airs are blowing on the rose of May, Sweet eyes are shining down the garden gay, Aught yet of dead yestreen you cannot say, No more of it, so sweet is this to-day. When death uproots my life-plant, ear and grain, And flings them forth to moulder on the plain, If men shall make a wine-jug of my clay, 
and brim with wine, twill leap to life again. This jar was once a lover like to me, lost in the light of wooing one like thee. And, lo, the handle here upon the neck was once the arm that held her neck in fee. Your love lets hold my hair forsaken head, therefore my lips in warning wine are red. Repentance born of reason you have wrecked, and time has torn the robe that patience made. End of section Section 4 of A Second Rubiat Miscellany This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Uma of Nishapur by Charles J. Pickering Reprinted from the National Review, December 1890 Part 1 Of the comparatively few Oriental writers who have become well known in Europe, Al-Khayyam has perhaps been the least fortunate. Ignored by Derbelot, misrepresented and maligned by von Hummer, and made the mouthpiece of a purely modern pessimism by his most successful translator, the shade of the old Hakim, were it not long ago well lulled to sleep beneath the ancestral roses, might justly have risen in reproach of a misbelieving and unsympathetic generation, which deems itself wiser than the children of the dawn. The brilliant paraphrase of Edward Fitzgerald has made the name of Umar somewhat of a household word. As an English poem, it is so nearly faultless that, for those to whom its haunting music has been a companion of years, to balance calmly its merits and defects would be no easy task. But when we compare it with the original, we are surprised to find how much of the English version is original too. And this is not all of the indictment. It traditori, traditori, runs the Italian proverb, and rarely could it find an apter illustration than the case in point. Among a considerable section of his Oriental readers, as in the parallel case of Hafez, and, since von Hummer's time, in Europe generally, Umar has had to bear the character of a poetic black sheep. Following in the track of the author of the Geschichte der schönen Redekunste Persiens, the translator, while investing his subject with a beauty of rhythm and phrase that reminds us rather of the laureate than of any eastern songster, throws the sceptical side of Umar's genius into still darker shadow, so that the vacillating doubt and despondency of the Persian grow, in his hands, a paean of passionate denial and defiance. It would, however, be unfair to contend that for this there is positively no warrant in the original. Lawless and uncertain thoughts occur, but they seem rather to be thrown out at random, stray sparks from the furnace of a fiery spirit ill at ease with itself, than parts of a deliberate system of Heinesque mockery or of Byronic scorn. Phrases scattered here and there throughout the Rubaiyat are given an emphasis and used in the sequence their author would probably have been the first to disown. Indeed, at the outset, it would have been better Pace, the Calcutta reviewer, to whom we owe a debt of gratitude for his delightful biographical sketch, to have taken Umar as a mind of the Horatian rather than of the Lucretian order. For system, of all things, is what is least conspicuous in the kaleidoscopic pages of the Rubaiyat. Well does Mr. Winfield, his English editor, say, with reference to the philosophic kinship of the poet, the parallel often sought to be traced between him and Lucretius has no existence. Whatever he was, he was not an atheist. To him, as to other Mohammedans of his time, to deny the existence of the deity would seem to be tantamount to denying the existence of the world and of himself. It must be borne in mind that Al-Khayyam, if the bulk of what has come down to us as his be genuine, is a man of many moods that he had been initiated into all the mysteries of Tazawuf can hardly be questioned. Even Mr. Fitzgerald, who rejects the Sufism of Hafez and a fortiori, that of Umar, admits some traditional presumption in favour of this view, and that his powerful and original intellect sometimes led him to the threshold of a broader truth, 
faith in which had risen on the basis of an honest doubt, which feebler minds so little understood, seems no less certain. Footnote. The words of a powerful, though obscure English poet of the 17th century are here peculiarly applicable. In both temperament and experience, there was much in common between the two men. Though truth and falsehood be near twins, yet truth a little elder is. Be busy to seek her, believe me this. He's not of none, nor worst, that seeks the best. To adore, or scorn an image, or protest, may all be bad. Doubt wisely, in strange way to stand inquiring right, is not to stray. Done. Third Satire End footnote Few of his successors ever rose so high. The lighter or looser rhymes, amid which these passages occur, like sparks among the stubble, and whose proximity is due to that odd eastern fashion which ranges poems according to the alphabetic sequence of their terminal letters, only serve to heighten by contrast the effect of these loftier utterances, which, if gathered together, would yield quite a new conception of Umar's character and genius. Footnote. In La Quatrains de Quiam, Paris, 1867, Monsieur Nicolas has collected upwards of 460 rubaiyat, or rather has republished that collection lithographed in Tehran some years before. It is, however, only fair to state that Mr. Fitzgerald based his version on the very small recu in the Bodleian, manuscript Usley, 140, containing several quatrains not found in the editions of the Imperial Dragoman, which seems to have appeared just too late to be of any practical use to the English poet. The Oxford Codex, which, scanty as it is, must be admitted to be one of the oldest redactions, it was transcribed in 1461, is well represented in Mr. E. H. Winfield's scholarly edition of the Rubaiyat, Krubner, 1883, to which the reader is referred for bibliographical and biographical particulars. End footnote. In the Tariq ul Hakuma, a philosophical compendium of great value, whose original author, Jamal Uddin Ali, died not much more than a century after Umar, we find an interesting notice of him, which, though written from an unfriendly point of view, supports our contention that Al Qayyam's temper was not purely Pyrrhonic, if indeed it was Pyrrhonic at all. Umar al Khayyam, Imam of Khurasan, and the profoundest savant of his time, was learned in the science of the Greeks, Yunan. He was ever urging the quest of the one only judge by means of the purification of bodily motions and the sublimation of the human soul, and he enjoined the zealous study of political science according to the principles of the Greek philosophic school. The moderns of the Sufi sect have adopted and adapted to their own system the exoteric sense of part of his makings, and bring it up for discussion in their assemblies and private gatherings. But their esoteric sense consists in axioms of comparative religion, sharia atu loisi, and maxims of universal obligation. But since the people of his day reviled him for his belief, and exposed to view the secrets he had veiled from them, he feared for his blood, and reined in the bridle of his tongue and pen. He made the pilgrimage, not from piety, but as a result of a chance rencontre, wherein also he betrayed the secrets of his heart's ungodliness. When he got to Baghdad, the men of his own method in ancient science beset him, but he shut on them the door with the shutting of compunction and not of companionship, Sadda ndimi la sadda ndimi. And he returned from the Hajj unto his city to repair morning and evening to the place of worship, concealing his secret thoughts. Yet they could not but out. He was unparalleled in astronomy and natural philosophy, hikmat, and his preeminence in these provinces would have passed into a proverb had he only safeguarded his good name. Laurazaku la smarta. By him there are fugitive verses whose secret sense pierces their veil of concealment and whose fount of conception is troubled by the turbidness of their hidden intent. Since my soul is content with an easy enough 
so that little sans toil palm nor arm may procure from the turns and reversions of time it is safe guard me hand and heart's aim in my life's darkest hour in the dizzying whirl hath the heavens not decreed that all fortunate stars to disaster should lower then patience o soul in thy noonday repose build the base in too close thou all topplest the tower it is a remarkable fact that nearly all that is best in the history and literature of persia has come from Khorasan. that highland region whose mountains often rise to an elevation of twelve or thirteen thousand feet seems to have been peculiarly fitted to foster a strain of hardy intellectual growth which grafted on the product of the rich soil of historic iran was to blossom in strange and beautiful fertility the banu barmak the premier clan of the old gubra aristocracy of persia extirpated at one fell swoop by the relentless suspicion of the most fortunate of the caliphs originated in Khorasan. the alus saman the nursing fathers of persian letters trace their ancestry to a like source and it was at the brilliant court of abu nasir the lord of Khorasan and transoxiana that the genius of master Rudaji, the proto-poet of modern iran was cultivated to an almost phenomenal activity by showers of unstinted gold and here it was that persia's loftiest and most human singer the immortal firdausi was born umar therefore from his cradle could not but have been breathing a poetic air and his love for his native land is testified by the heimweh which led him in the full sunshine of imperial favour and at the apex of his scientific fame to seek retirement for the rest of his days at nishapur one need not linger over the circumstances of umar's career which are sufficiently well known born about the end of the eleventh century's third decade in a township of nishapur at the imperial madrash of that city he not only received from the imam muwafiq a time white father of eighty or ninety summers the solid foundations of a knowledge of the best science of the time but made in the person of abul quazim better known as nizam ul mulk the future chancellor of three sultans and the most enlightened administrator of medieval asia a friendship which was to have a signal effect upon his own fortunes and was only to be severed by death it was the nizam's first action when he had attained the supreme power in the state under alp ashlan the saluk to offer office to his old schoolfellow but umar like the true sage hakim that he was requested nothing but a modest pension that would suffer him to be true to himself the generous friend made over to him the revenue of his native place and umar spent the remainder of his peaceful days at nishapur busy in winning knowledge of every kind and especially in astronomy says nazum ul mulk himself one journey of his is recorded when in the splendid reign of malik shah he visited marv and the sultan lavished praises and honours on his famous geometer whose labours had effected that rectification of the calendar and which still holds good in the mohammedan east and according to gibbon or rather hyde approaches the correctness of the gregorian style footnote an algebraic tract edited by m werpke paris eighteen fifty one is the only extant scientific production of umars his work seems to have been silently absorbed in that of later mathematicians End footnote. the snatches of song which have immortalized his name seem to have been his relaxation from the strain of professional toil in this he offers a striking resemblance to two of the greatest poets of europe dante and goethe to whom the pursuit of knowledge was the business of life and to sing of it their recreation a passionate devotion to natural science is characteristic of all three and in each we see a yearning love of human sympathy and a power of pure and lofty friendship which reminds us of the antique world but from all accounts it seems as indeed one might gather from his verses that umar's devotion even to science was not that of an anchorite persian chroniclers tell us says monsieur nicolas that Khayyam was much given to converse and quaff with his friends in moonlit evenings on the terrace of his house. He, seated upon a carpet, 
surrounded by singers and musicians, with a saki who, cup in hand, offered the wine to all the joyous company in turn. An usage which, with the substitution of the crystal decanter for the terracotta cruise and the wine glass for the cup of copper, still holds in Persia at the present day. We must remember, says a thoughtful writer in Fraser for May 1879, footnote, Mrs. H. M. Cadell, who was the first in England to draw attention to the true Omar Khayyam, end footnote, that drinking had, in the East at that time, no vulgar associations. Wine parties were common in the houses of the great men and in the courts of the princes. These wine parties were in fact the nurseries of all the intellectual life of the time, which was unconnected with religion, and did much to counteract the dullness of orthodox Mohammedan life. Footnote. In the Zadur Musafir, a medical treatise written in the latter half of the 10th century by a physician of Kaiwan, Abu Jafar by name, he is ranked with Avicenna, Averroes, and Razis. Etude sur le sade de Moukhitir, par Monsieur Gustave Donga, Journal Asiatique, Volume 3, 1854. We find a curious corroboration of the view just set forth. The best means of banishing a tendency to melancholy, and keeping it from enrooting itself in the mind, is to drink wine with melody, to be merry with one's friends, to occupy oneself with making and reciting verses, and to contemplate running water, gardens, verdure, and sweet fresh faces. Galen saith that whoso matures the first must of the grape, so that it rejoiceth the sorrowing spirit, and reneweth gladness, is a man of healing wisdom. And the learned African goes into much detail concerning the virtues of wine and of music, which are like a body and a soul and their combined action as a curative treatment is best seen, he says, when quaffing one seeth seated round him agreeable figures whose shape the Creator hath perfected and finished their graces, and on whom the soul's light coruscates in brilliance and beauty, and this, if possible, should be in the midst of fresh gardens and lawny parterres, or, at least, in halls carpeted with rose-leaves, and willow, and myrtle, and sweet basil, which maketh the sad heart to rejoice. With all this, he adds, let one beware of excess. End footnote. It has been suggested by von Hummer that Umar's flings at philosophy were stimulated by envy at the fame and fortune of Amir Muizi, who had risen from the position of Sipahi, Sepoy, or common soldier, to be the Dichterkönig, or laureate of Malik Shah, and ever in his favour, as the historian informs us. This singer was a Sufi mystic of undoubted sincerity, and so far as can be seen from the specimens given by von Hammer, held opinions not widely differing from those of Umar himself. One very characteristic Ghazal chants a lofty pantheism in terms well nigh identical with Umar's own. It might be, indeed, that at moments, when the doubting, questioning spirit had set in, the Khorasani took expressions of his famous contemporary in vain. And, of course, it is not impossible that some personal rivalry between the two poets may have existed, although such a feeling was alien to the self-contained and independent character of the author of the Rubaiyat. After all, Khayyam's mockery is more at the expense of self than of others, and his satire is evidently reserved for the pretenders to divine knowledge. For example, in the last quatrain, he says, They, who in ocean are of virtues and of wit, by whose consummate glory are all their fellows lit, out of this obscure slumber find us not a way, tell us an old wife's tale, and fall asleep in it. Elsewhere he brings out more clearly the cause of his dissatisfaction. Those who the whole world's quintessential spirit appear, who wing their contemplation past the crowning sphere, for all they know of thee are like the heavens themselves, dizzied and in amaze they bow the head in fear. He shadows forth the remedy in another passage, where also man, as the microcosm, is termed the quintessence, kalasar, of the world, 
and which may help us as a clue to the meaning of many of his ambiguous utterances about wine. O thou who art the cosmos quintessential strain, for a brief breath let be the worry of loss and gain. Take but one cup from the eternal sake, take, and go for ever free from the two worlds' grief and pain. The thought that one draught of the mystic wine, the love potion of the eternal, induces oblivion alike of natural and supernatural hope and fear, is elsewhere expressed under a different symbolism. In convent and in college, synagogue and church, of hell they live in fear, for paradise they search. But whoso once hath known the mysteries of God, will never let such weeds his soul's fair field besmirch. And in another quatrain, the quietest doctrine is enunciated with a still greater boldness. Each heart wherein he needs the leavening light of love, whether a haunter of mosque or synagogue he prove, in the great book of love, if he his name hath writ, is free from hell and free from paradise above. Footnote. Jeremy Taylor, in his sermon On the Mercy of the Divine Judgments, cites the story of St. Ivo going in an embassy to St. Louis, and meeting by the way a grave sad woman, with fire in one hand and water in the other, who, ask what these symbols may mean, makes answer, My purpose is with fire to burn paradise, and with my water to quench the flames of hell, that men may serve God without the incentives of hope and fear, and purely for the love of God. Vaughan's Hours with the Mystics, Volume 2, page 201. End footnote. This conclusion reminds us of the beautiful legend of Abu bin Adam, so gracefully and tenderly versified by Lee Hunt. Write me as one that loves his fellow men. But that Umar's love is rather the divine affection which rounds all human brotherhood and charity in its perfect orb. The formalism of current orthodoxy seems to have exercised the mind of Umar in no little degree, and accounts for much of his apparent irreverence. He frequently takes up his parable against the Pharisees and hypocrites of his day, and their practice of making long prayers arouses his especial dislike. To him, the humble hope that trusts, and is not afraid, is a truer adoration than that which clothes itself in the garb of liturgical forms. They are gone, the travellers, and ne'er one returns, to tell of aught beyond the mystic veil that burns. Thy work were better done by esperance than prayer, for without truth and hope no prayer a prophet earns. The above reads like the recantation of an utterance closing in the same rhyme cadence, of which it is the perfect antithesis. Of all the travellers who tread the long, long way, as one returned for me to ask him news, I pray. Take care lest thou within this little inn of life leave aught on the score of hope, thou'lt not review the day. In reading the Rubaiyat we seem to be spectators of a life drama, a master spirit's progress and development through the clash and conflict of the eternal nay and yea. Not less so, though less fully expressed, than that of Carlyle in Sartor, Shakespeare in the Sonnets, or Tennyson in In Memoriam. When we begin to trace our way through the sad jumble of thought produced by the alphabetical arrangement of the quatrains, no two of which were probably more consecutive than a pair of Greek epigrams, we cannot but be conscious of three dominant moods of mind, if not periods of mental development, Epicurean, Sceptical, Mystic. Infinite and well-nigh imperceptible are the gradations whereby the exhortation to mere physical enjoyment, the joyous and thoughtless spirit of youth, pass over into the bitter or sorrowful questioning of a soul without God or hope in the world. And these, again, through the self-abasement of conscious sin, into the calm and deliberate utterance of trust, or the half-enigmatical rapture of one who sees behind the veil. And, as every great spirit exists, no less as the child of his own age than, for all time, so we may consider Umar's earlier compositions to have been influenced, if not inspired, by the prevailing fashion of the time, with its princely symposiums and feasts of reason, and not a little 
by the graceful wine songs of Avicenna, died ten thirty seven, in whom also science blossomed into poetry, as in his later days, grown wiser by the discipline of intellectual defeat, he became more and more in harmony with that profounder cast of thought and feeling which found, a few years later, so grand an exponent in Jaluddin of Ikomium and an interpreter to the world in Sadi of Shiraz. It is the remark of von Hammer that a sceptical era is followed no less in nations than in individuals by a period of mystic devotion and the religious revival which is its external token and garb. We need not, therefore, be discouraged by the strange ambiguity of many of Umar's utterances, where it seems equally difficult to accept the literal or parabolic sense. That a poet may, at one period of his life, use a phrase in the ordinary acceptation, which, in a later development of thought, he may employ as a symbol of higher things, is not without a notable example, in the case of Dante, whose human, if not sensuous passion, sublimated by the fire of bereavement and sorrow, is ultimately refined into a high rapture of mystic adoration, whose terms are yet the same, though in their later tenor, like kindred sounds in Spencer's enchanted forest, or the dream world of Blake, more is meant than meets the ear. End of part one. End of section. Section 5 of A Second Rubaiyat Miscellany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Umar of Nishapur by Charles J. Pickering. Part 2. Umar's wine epigram is sometimes so dark a saying that for lack of an interpreter we are fain to leave it in its own melodious obscurity, not without a shrewd suspicion that he, like other powerful minds, is occasionally apt to take pleasure in mystifying his hearers and to send forth his poetic shafts for nanta sintoisen, without very much care as to where and who the understanding may be. His friends would hold the key, and that was enough for him. There is a strange and terribly audacious play of fancy about the following, which may or may not be figurative. When I am dead, my friends, wash me with vintage rare, Wine and the goblet o'er me invoke in lieu of prayer. On resurrection day, if ye would seek my lair, Look for me neath the dust our wine-house portals bear. Elsewhere he recurs to the same thought. O my beloved companions, hearten me with wine, And make ye ruby red this ambered face of mine. Wash ye with wine my corpse when I am cold and dead, And make my coffin wood of timber of the vine. By comparison with the following, we get a little light. The Quran, which men use to call the word sublime, not constantly they read, only from time to time. But on the beaker's brim is written a verse of light, which men for evermore may read in every clime. According to the exoteric Zahiri sense, this, of course, means merely that potation is better than devotion. But, as the Tehran Sufi pointed out to Nicola, there is another, and an esoteric, Batini, which interprets the wine-cup as the world of phenomena, brimming with the love of God, and the inscription on the lip, the apocalypse of himself in creation, which, unlike the scrolls of mortal prophets, is ever open to those under whose eyes it is given to see. In another place, he gives to the thought, if we may interpret it in the above sense, a still more mystical expression. Drink thou of this, it is the wine of life etern. Drink, tis the reservoir whence joys of youth ye earn. Tis burning like the fire, yet lighteneth our face, even like the water of life. Drink deeply from the urn. To this passage there is rather a remarkable parallel in the Jewish Christian apocryphal book of Esdras, 2nd Esdras, chapter 14, verses 39 and 40. The prophet, watching under the oak tree for his revelation, has a vision of the Lord. Behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full, as it were, with water, but the colour of it was like fire, and I took it and drank, and when I had drunk of it, 
my heart uttered understanding, and wisdom grew in my breast. But whatever we may think of the foregoing, there is surely little that is enigmatical about the following. On the world's coquetry, fools, lavish not your coin, when all her ways and windings know ye, line by line. Give not unto the wind this precious life, your own, but hasten, seek the friend, and quickly quaff the wine. Footnote. We are reminded of the dying words of Nizam ul Muk. O oh God, I am passing away in the hand of the wind. End footnote. The prevailing thought, however, of those which we would consider as the earlier quatrains is the brevity of life and the Horatian maxim carpe diem. It is on these, as indeed we might expect in a youthful poet, that Umar has chiefly expended the wealth of his fancy. A few may be adduced as fair samples of the rest. Wake, for the morning breaks, and rends the robe of night. Why sorrowful? Rise, and quaff the draught of dawn aright. Drain thou the wine, sweetheart, for many a morn shall break, and turn her eyes to ours, and ours be lawn of light. The yesterday that's gone endeavour to forget, and mourn not for to-morrow, tis not risen yet. Root not thy hope in aught of things that come and go. Be happy now, and fling not life to the winds to fret. A wise man unto me came in my sleep and said, From whose sleep ever bloomed the rose of gladness red? Why wilt thou do a thing that so the twin of death? Drink, for full soon thou'lt sleep with dust above thy head. See how the wind of dawn has rent the rose's robe, how bulbul by her beauty is filled with joy and love. Sit in the rose's shade, for many a bloom like this has out of the dust arisen and lain with dust above. Since no one can become a surety for the morrow, rejoice thee now, and clear thy heart of carking sorrow. Drink wine in the light of wine, for the moon, my moon, shall look for us no more, how oft the heaven she circle through. Tis a sweet day, the breeze is neither hot nor cold, soft clouds have laid the dust from every rose's fold, and to the yellow rose, in speech like ours, implores the nightingale. One draught, and lose thy hue of gold. Be of good cheer, for chagrin will be infinite. Upon the sphere of heaven, stars shall conjoin and smite. The potter's clay that from thy body need shall be, will build the palace walls where others see the light. Kayam, times very self's ashamed of any one, who in the day of sorrow sits faint-hearted down. Wine do thou quaff in crystal to the lute's lament, or ere thy crystal bowl be shattered on the stone. Lay in my palm the wine, my heart's on fire to-day, and fleet foot as quicksilver, this life will not stay. Wake, for the smile of fortune is but as a dream. Wake, for the fire of youth like water flows away. What time her roving purple on her the violet throws, and morning breezes ruffle petal folds of rose, wiser were he who by his silver-breasted love quaffs of the wine and shatters goblet ere he goes. Occasionally, as in his Roman prototype, we catch, amid this forced gaiety, a tone of deeper pathos. T'were best we o'er the wine-cup gave our hearts to glee, and take light thought of aught that's gone or come to be. And this our soul that's lent us, prisoner as it is, one moment from the bonds of intellect set free. Ah, that the scroll of youth so soon should be uprolled, and pleasure's springtide freshness wrinkle so, and fold. That bird of joy, whereon is set the name of youth, knows neither how it came, nor whither its course must hold. Where never a labour of ours has issue to our heart, wherefore should we take thought, where to our impulse start? So sit we down in sorrow, and sigh in our regret. Too late, too late we came, too soon must we depart. In this wild whirl of time, that breeds the base alone, Uncounted griefs and pangs bear I till life be done. My heart, a rosebud shut, i' the rosier of the world, 
a blood-red tulip flower in time's plantation grown his longing for the sympathy of a kindred spirit a maham i raz a confidant of soul secrets which is characteristic of all true poets the nec recito cui cum nisi amicis of horace in a deeper sense finds expression again in the following falcon like in the world of mystery have i flown in hope to leave this low and reach a loftier zone but for i find not here a soul for confidence i from that door whereby i came again am gone in spite of his distinctly sufi flavour this quatrain can surely be read in a merely human sense he has felt for but not yet found the eternal friend and in his loneliness he yearns for a brother man with whom to share his perplexities as with shakespeare in his middle period that of timon and of troilus there seems to have come a time in umar's history when the beauty of life was as apples of sodom the bitterness of self-reproach a very mara to his soul a time when he could not sing as in the thoughtless days plant not within thy soul the shoot of sorrow's tree the manuscript of joy read unremittingly for the newly awakened conscience will not be lulled and gives him no rest when the thought of my faults presents itself before me he says my face flows down with tears that are born of my heart of fire at this wild whirl of heaven i sorrow evermore and with my own base nature ever am at war science avails me not to rise above the world nor reason lets me rest where no earth noises roar to the reproaches of those who do not understand him and accuse him of moral cowardice he replies and the humility of his answer is reflected in his style deem not it is the world whereat i am dismayed or death and soul's departure frighten with their shade for that it is a fact of death have i no fear tis that i live not well whereof i am afraid in the turmoil of self-accusation and self-excuse he seeks for comfort in the doctrine of determinism which he had imbibed from childhood and gives it a characteristic turn that day the steed of heaven was saddled for the race Pawan and mushtari sprang forth in all their grace in the divan of fate was my lot cast also how then should sin be mine with destiny in the chase in his perplexity he is almost ready to reproach the first cause thou before whom the maze of sin is clear to see to him hath ears to hear declare this mystery for knowledge absolute of sin's cause to conceive in a wise man's eyes the extreme of ignorance would be it seems to him that if the nature of sin its causal power had been present to the infinite consciousness it would never in the scheme of creation have been suffered to be an anticipation we might almost say of that philosophy of the unconscious which has proceeded from the school of schopenhauer footnote this theory of the unconsciousness of the first cause is taught by plotinus and seems to have been held by clement of alexandria whose logos is the consciousness of the father big the christian platonists 1886 pages 10 and 54 End footnote wearied with beating his wings against the bars of this insoluble problem he falls back upon a pathetic remonstrance and lament of clay and water hast thou needed me what can i hast woven me of silk and wool to be what can i and every deed i give to life be it good or ill was written on my soul by thy decree what can i al khayyam's final appeal for remission if we may so regard it, is not without an added interest for us as having been the subject of one of the most daring inversions in literature. The following is a bald reproduction of Umar's words as they stand in the Tehran text. O knower of the secrets of the heart of every man, who in the hour of weakness bears the part of every man, accept, O Lord, my penitence, and me forgiveness give, thou who forgiver and excuser art of every man. This quatrain, as Mrs. Cadell was the first to point out, is the sole known warrant for that startling passage in Mr. Fitzgerald's poem which has so largely affected our conception of Umar. O thou, 
who man of baser earth didst make, and e'en with paradise devised the snake, for all the sin wherewith the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. Kayam was bold enough at times, remarks the critic, but we do not think he reached the point of offering God forgiveness for man's sins. The allusions in the second and third lines do not seem to be traceable in any extant text of the Rubaiyat. Let us now examine a few Rubaiyat of the strictly mystical class, that which we would consider characteristic of his later and graver years. But, between these and the rest, there is no hard and fast line to be drawn. There is no sudden conversion, but a gradually growing conviction of eternal realities, not objectively merely, but as existent in the self, the individual consciousness. This reunion of finite with infinite, the maksad i aksa, or the uttermost aim of Sufi devotion, is beautifully figured by Jalal in one of his ghazals, as translated most worthily by Mr. Gibb, in appendix to the book of Sindibad, edited by W. A. Clouston, Glasgow, 1884, page 270. If to travel thou canst not avail, then journey to thine own heart, and e'en as the ruby mine, be fired by the ray serene. O master, journey thou forth, away from thyself to thyself, for the ore of the mine turns gold by a journey like this, I ween. From sourness and bitterness here, to the region of sweetness fair, for that every moon from the light of the sun is with grace beseen. In his own quaint manner, Al-Kayam gives the thought expression. While on the path of hope, let no heart pass unknown. While on the path of presence, make a friend your own. A hundred clay and water kabas are not worth one heart. Whereafter seek, and kabas leave alone. Footnote. Niaz, hope or aspiration, and hazur, presence, the beatific vision, are respectively the second and penultimate stages of the tadik, or way of perfection, of which the fourth and last is hakikat, truth equals God, absolute absorption into the divine essence or nirvana. End footnote. As he rises in the scale of insight, his sympathies widen, and he can perceive that to the true believer no faith is alien, and that variations and discrepancies of worship, be it sincere, are less of kind than of degree, the fairest feature of the mystic school in every age. Hinduism, which he typifies by the name Pagoda, Butkada, or Idol House, and which was, in his time, the object of unceasing crusades on the part of Islam, is more than once brought by him into honourable prominence, and is made, equally with Zoroastrianism and with Christianity, the vehicle of his wider hope. Pagoda, Kaaba, both are temples of true service. The bell peal is the hymning music of true service. The mihrab and the church, the rosary and cross, in truth are one, and all but tokens of true service. Elsewhere, by a play upon words not unknown to the Hebrew scriptures, he opposes to the everlasting light, Nur, of Islam, the eternal fire, Nar, of Mazdaism. Not surely, as Nicola would have us suppose, the fire of hell, unless, indeed, there being a lurking double entendre, mischievously contrived for those profane ones who could or would not distinguish the one from the other, a view quite in keeping with what we know of Umar's character. Though our lot be not the roses, yet we have the thorn, and there's a fire, although for us no light be born, and there's the belfry chime and church and Brahma thread, although no kunkah shelter or darvish dress be worn. This feeling is expressed as boldly in the Rubai, where he says that the worshipper, whether he be Jew or Muslim, if only his name is written in God's great book of love, all Garthios Agapi Esti, is freed alike from the gross pains and the grosser pleasures of the popular hell and paradise, a sentiment strangely in opposition to the recorded injunction of Muhammad, spare not the synagogue of Satan. That spiritual liberty, whose correlative in the moral sphere is the autarchia of Epictetus, and Antonine, 
is the object of his earnest longing, if haply he may find it. The heart that isolation's fullness doth not own is helpless, daily mate of her own penitent moan. How shall true joy be hers, except the soul is free? All else, whate'er it be, is root of grief alone. Like Sir Henry Wotton, he can picture to himself the blissful state of the man who is lord of himself, though not of lands, and having nothing, yet hath all. Indeed, his conception has as much a Christian as a Stoic flavour, and recalls the Sermon on the Mount, as well as the Meditations. Happy the heart of him who passes life unknown, who never wore cashmere or lawn or lamb's wool gown, who like the Simurg wings his flight in highest heaven, who makes not like the owl mid ruined worlds his moan. In this world, whoso hath but half a loaf of bread, and in his breast a refuge where to lay his head, who of no man is slave, who of no man is lord, tell such to live in joy. His world is sweet indeed. All these currents of thought meet and mingle in one harmonious outburst of devotion, which is vigorously expressed in Umar's truest style. In faith are two and seventy worships, great and small, but the worship of thy love will I choose before them all. What's unbelief, belief, obedience, or sin? Before thee, the one aim, let all pretenses fall. Here, in common with the mystics of every school, he seeks to solve the riddle of evil by questioning its existence in fact, or by assuming it to be merely relative, a shadow which, rightly seen, is swallowed up in the fullness of the infinite light. And to this conclusion he must have been helped not a little by the deterministic theology which he had learned from the Imam Muwafiq, and to which he gives, as to every phase of his thought, a characteristic expression. Limbed on creation's tablet, each and all exists, yet evermore from good or ill the pencil rests. All that is destined must in justice come to be, and vain the wish that yearns, the sorrow that resists. From the belief that good and evil, in our sense of the words, are banished from the counsels of eternity, to a denial to moral distinctions of anything but a relative existence, was but a step. This most dangerous doctrine, so capable of the corruptio optimi pessima, is touched upon by Jami, the last of the great Sufi poets, in a proem to his exquisite allegory Salaman and Absal, as a prayer that the beatific vision may annihilate his self-identity and release him from the distinction between good and evil, may make him, as Mr. Fitzgerald well expresses it in his fine paraphrase, self-lost and conscience quit of good and evil. Sometimes Umar's rapture of contemplation carries him very high, and his tone, though not his style, reminds us now of Shelley and now of Emerson. Take, for example, the following. Thou, whom the whole world seeks in frenzy and fire of mind, barren alike before thee are rich and poor mankind. Thou art mingled in all speech, and every ear is deaf, Thou art present to all men, and every eye is blind. Some time to mortal man thou show'st thy hidden face, Some time art manifest in cosmic form and trace, And this magnificence show'st thou to thine own self, For thou art the eyes that see, the vision they embrace. The drop to the sea's lamenting, separate are we, Rather tis thou and I are all things, laughs the sea. Truly there is none other, we are God alone, tis but a tittle's varying sunders thee and me. We should be doing injustice to Umar's genius, were we to omit from our view that aspect of it which is so characteristic of the man, and singles him out from all his fellows. That grotesque humour, so rare in Eastern literature, which is the one point he possesses in common with Heine and which we may almost say is the antiseptic salt that has preserved his thought fresh for us after the lapse of centuries. This spirit of self-banter, which plays lightly around so many of his utterances, is not quite absent from even such a topic as the assurance of his own immortality, to which it gives the quaintest of turns. 
yet here he is evidently in earnest. The moment when I shall from death escape and flee, and shed like leaf from bough my body from life's tree, with what glad heart I'll make the universe a sieve, or ere an earthly riddle sift the dust of me. The same spirit is noticeable in one of his potatory quatrains, of which it were difficult to say whether he is merely jesting or is propounding a Sufic sentiment under a bizarre form. Like some passages already quoted, it is of so enigmatical a character as to fairly baffle our scrutiny. When Asia Dawn begins to lift her light divine, look in thine hand there be the wine-bowl flashing fine. They say that truth is ever bitter in the mouth, and by that argument the truth must needs be wine. In the same category we might include a quatrain in which Kayam, after his own peculiar fashion, reproaches fortune's wheel. Ah, wheel of heaven, no guest but fears thy perfidy. Naked thou keep'st me stripped as fish that's in the sea. While all creation's clad by spinning wheels of earth, there's ne'er a spinning wheel but far surpasseth thee. We have seen how Umar speaks of Christianity. Let us see how a Mohammedan may speak of its founder. Even though it be not genuine, the rubai was assuredly written by a Muslim. The mode adopted is that of self-remonstrance. Fool, for thy fear of death and boding of surcease, when from extinction springs a life of endless bliss, soon as in Isa's breath I grow a living soul, eternal death shall leave my little life in peace. The quickening breath of Jesus is frequently made a poetic figure by the Persians, and sometimes, as in the Masibat Nama of Attar, the effect of its miraculous exertion is described. But nowhere, so far as we are aware, is the spiritual significance so beautifully brought out as in the above. Footnotes 1. To convince a sinner, Mariam's son makes earth rosy with the blood of a gazelle, broils and partakes of it then, gathering the bones, breathes into them. New life the fawn snatched from that breath's impress, worshipped, and sprang into the wilderness. Footnote 2. Hafez, after his fashion, makes Issa lead the celestial dance with Zura, Venus, the spirit of the evening star. End of footnotes. We must, however, bear in mind that by the Persian, Jesus was regarded less as the penultimate prophet of Islam than as the supreme Sufi, that master mystic who had attained absolute identity with deity, and who was, to all who followed in the same path of contemplation and purity, at once a teacher and a type. There is yet one aspect more of Umar's mind in which we have not contemplated him, and this is a very amiable one. With it, let us take our leave of him, laying at his feet our feeble tribute of admiration and sympathy, in the hope that the circle of his true friends and faithful interpreters may widen, and that, in his own words, he may bind many a heart to him hereafter in the cords of love. Though the world's face thou make all populous to be, tis far less than to bring one sorrowing heart in glee. If thou, by graciousness, but make one freeman bend, tis better than to set a thousand bondmen free. End of Uma of Nishapur by Charles J. Pickering End of section Section 6 of A Second Rubiat Miscellany This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Versions of H. G. Keen The Real Kayam In Macmillan's magazine, for November 1887, volume 57, page 27, Mr. H. G. Keane, a retired East Indiaman, familiar with Persian, had an article entitled Omar Khayyam, in which he included a number of original versions, not with the intention, he says, of shocking the admirers of Mr. Fitzgerald by an attempt to compete with his poetical treatment, but offered as illustrative of the real Khayyam in his disjointed manner. He gives Fitzgerald due credit, but while he calls his quatrains as unquestionably among the fine things in modern English verse, 
he avers that they give no accurate representations of the original in any of their versions, as indeed the variations of successive editions do themselves tend to show. Omar, he continues, is no more coherent than Marshall, as anyone will see who looks into Mr. Winfield's version in Trubner's series. Here is the epigram of a scoffer, there the ejaculation of a pious inquirer. The carol of the wine-bibber is followed by a stanza of tender love. In Fitzgerald, on the other hand, we are not sure whether we are reminded most of Horace or of Ecclesiastes, of the flighty Persian freethinker, eclectic and unsystematic, we see little or nothing. After giving an historical explanation of the phenomenon of this unparalleled figure in the usually conventional literature of the East, he proceeds to show from his rubiat what manner of man Omar was. An unparalleled figure. We must picture to ourselves the poet in his garden, looking out on the well-watered valley below Meshed, with vines and fruit plots around, and a bright sky overhead, assuaged by shadowy plane trees, while streams lapsed softly through the meadow grass. It was a retreat, yet with loopholes, for the neighbourhood of the town afforded some choice of society. Omar's hospitality was open to pleasant persons of both sexes, to all, indeed, but zealots. He was not one to confuse belief with faith. Heterodoxy is as bad in his eyes as orthodoxy. You may do what you will if you will be cheerful and undogmatic. He is the slave of freedom. To drink and revel and laugh is all my art. To smile at faith and unfaith my faith's part. I asked the bride what gift would win her love. She answered, Give me but a cheerful heart. That he is ambitious, in the vulgar sense of sighing for the perishable advantages of wealth and station, no one can believe. He may desire to influence his fellow creatures, but it is as a friend rather than as a master. For personal comfort, he looks not to luxury, but to love, not to the blind assurance of the bigot, but to the confidence of innocence and goodness. If in your heart the light of love you plant, whether the mosque or synagogue you haunt, if in love's court its name be registered, hell it will fear not, heaven it will not want. His Questioning It has been thought that Khayyam was a Sufi and only used the language of pleasure as a symbol for pantheistic aspiration. But he can be outspoken, and such questions as the following are neither equivocal nor ambiguous. This is the time for roses and repose beside the stream that through the garden flows. A friend or two, a lady, rosy-cheeked, with wine, and none to hear the clergy prose. Unless girls pour the wine, the wine is naught, without the music of the flute is naught. Look as I may into the things of life, mirth is the only good, the rest is naught. The red wine in a festal cup is sweet, with sound of lute and dulcimer is sweet. A saint, to whom the wine cup is not known, he too, a thousand miles from us, is sweet. Not but what he has his pious hours, for to nothing but true piety can we ascribe such thoughts as these. Thou hast no way to enter the dark court, for not to mortals does it yield resort. There is no rest but on the lap of earth. Woe, that its riddle is so far from short. Ah, brand, ah, brand, if all that thou canst earn be but to help the fires of hell to burn, why wilt thou cry, Have mercy, Lord, on me? Is it from such as thee that he will learn? Of thy Creator's mercy do not hold doubt, though thy crimes be great and manifold, nor think that, if thou die in sin to-day, he from thy bones his mercy will withhold. His Dignified Attitude Yet, Convinced as he is of the need of pardon, and not always sure, in his human diffidence, that his lord is anything but a magnified sultan, who exercises man with willful and arbitrary caprice, he preserves his dignity in the face of the appalling possibility. Although God's service has not been my care, 
nor for his coming was my heart made fair. I still have hope to find the mercy seat, because I never wearied him with prayer. Am I a rebel? Then his power is, where? Is my heart dark? His light and glory, where? Doth he give heaven for our obedience? Tis due, but then his loving kindness, where? These speculations bring him to the old conclusion. Although my sins have left me faint and fell, one hope I keep, the heathen have it as well. In dying may I clasp my girl and glass, what else to me were paradise or hell? If I drink wine, it is not for delight, nor unto holiness to do despite. I do it to breathe a little, free from self. No other cause would make me drink all night. They say that Tophet from of old was planned, but that's what I could never understand. If there were hell for those who drink, then heaven would be no fuller than one's hollow hand. With wine and music, if our lives have glee, if grass beside the running brook wave free, better than this esteemed no quenched hell, this is thy heaven, if heaven indeed there be. Enjoy the passing moment. He is not sure whether, even on this side of the grave, perfect bliss is to be had, and in such uncertainty it would be folly to strive. But he is quite sure of the wisdom of savouring to the utmost the passing moment, and, like Horace, he makes the precariousness of joy a reason for enjoyment. Since life flies fast, what's bitter and what's sweet? When death draws near, what matter field or street? Drink wine, for after thee and me the moon her alternating course will oft repeat. I dreamed of an old man who said, and frowned, The rose of bliss in sleep was never found. Why then anticipate the work of death? Drink rather, sleep awaits thee in the ground. Ah, comrades, strengthen me with cups of wine until my faded cheeks like rubies shine and bathe me in it after I am dead and weave my shroud with tendrils of the vine. Sweet Companionship But these contemplations, these delights, could not always be taken, or did not always suffice. Posprandia Caliho Like his European prototypes, the Persian philosopher found woman essential to his scheme. His paradise must never want an Eve with whom he could share alike his joys and his troubles. Clouds come and sink upon the grass in rain. Let wine's red roses make our moments fain, and let the verdure please our eyes to-day, ere grass from our dust shall give joy again. Sweetheart, if time a cloud on thee have flung, to think the breath must leave thee, now so young, sit here, upon the grass, a day or two, while yet no grass from thy dust shall have sprung. Long before thee and me were night and morn, for some great end the sky is round us born. Upon this dust, ah, step with careful foot, some beauty's eyeball here may lie forlorn. This cup once loved, like me, a lovely girl, and sighed, entangled in a scented curl. This handle that you see upon its neck once wound itself about a neck of pearl. It is to be feared that, like Anacreon, the Eastern poet found that, as old age drew on, the ladies turned to younger loves. Ah, that the raw should have the finished cake, the immature the ripest produce take, at eyes that make the heart of man to beat, shine only for the boys and eunuchs' sake. Vague but trustful hope. But the things of fate approach. No epicurism can do much to strip necessity of its stern aspect. Sin is sin, and the soul, in the solitude of the dark valley, turns to the inevitable with vague but trustful hope. His mercy being gained, what need we fear? His scrip being full, no journey makes me fear. If, by his clemency, my face be white, in no degree the black book will I fear. I ward in vain with nature. What's the cure? 
I suffer for mine actions. What's the cure? I know God's mercy covers all my sin, for shame that he has seen it. What's the cure? Yet even here science brings a message that is not unconsoling. He may pass as an individual, but the moon will shine on others, and the grass be fair and odorous, and the very body that has known so much joy, when it was his, will contribute to other joys hereafter. Is it not a shame, because on every side thy curious eyes are circumscribed and tied, pent in this dark and temporary cell, in its poor bounds, contented to abide? O tent-maker, that frame is but a tent, thy soul the king, to realms of nothing bent, and slaves shall strike the tent for a fresh use, when the king rises and his night is spent. Here we come upon a stanza beautifully rendered by Fitzgerald. Speaking of the body, he makes the poet say, Or is it but a tent where rests anon a sultan to his kingdom, journeying on, and which the swarthy chamberlain shall strike, then when the monarch rises to be gone? Slight changes make great differences. The difference from the original is verbally but slight, but it will be observed to seriously alter the significance. Kayam's play on his name, Tentmaker, is sacrificed, so is the mockery of the soul's journey to an unreal kingdom. The word Chamberlain is an inadequate substitute for the original Farash, which indicates a class of slave appointed in the East for such duties, and to which the poet contemptuously likens death. A sample of Fitzgerald's manner of paraphrase may be interesting. The two metrical stanzas are his. The prose that follows gives the literal English of the original. O thou who didst with pitfall and with gin beset the road I was to wander in, thou wilt not with predestination round enmesh me and impute my fall to sin. O thou who man of basest clay didst make and who with Eden didst devise the snake, for all the sin with which the face of man is blackened, man's forgiveness give and take. In my way-going thou hast laid the snare in many a place. Thou sayest, I slay thee, if I make the fault therein. The world is not free from thy command a tittle. I do thy command, and thou callest me sinner. O thou, of the sanctity of whose nature knowledge is not, and art indifferent both to our obedience and sin. I am drunk with sin, but sober with hope, in that my hope is in thy great mercy. Omar's Philanthropy Kayam mocks at circumstances. Death is a slave. Even life, saving so far as it is a scene of calm enjoyment, is a mere bubble. The noise of the Franks in Syria is deadened by distance. The crimes of Hassan Sabah, the toils of Nizam ul Mulk, are ignored, while the poet surprises the secrets of nature, observing her economies of matter and her recklessness of man. But in regard to these hapless contemporaries, to whom the stern stepmother shows so little pity, he infers the duty of help, urging the indulgence of a brother orphan. Do thou beware no human heart to wring, let no one feel thine anger hotly sting. Wouldst thou enjoy perpetual happiness? Know how to suffer, cause no suffering. Here the veil shall fall, and our last glimpse of the poet show him in a posture of pity. He was summoned to Merv and employed in the reform of the calendar, and he died a natural death about 1123 at Naishapur, his old age being untroubled and his life unabridged. More than this, an Oriental of that time could not hope from fate. The rest of his happiness must come from within, as we will hope it did. One of his disciples tells us that Omar said in his old age, I would be buried in such a place that the north wind may scatter roses on it. After the poet's death, the disciple, visiting the grave, found that it was beneath a garden wall, and the fruit trees reached their boughs over and dropped their blossoms over his tomb, so that it was almost hidden. The Scriptural Worth of the Quatrains One of the curious features of Kayam's life and labour is the fact of such heterodox and seemingly unprofitable matter surviving, with no aid from the printing press, 
to the havoc of seven stormy centuries. Of this we may be sure, that no nation preserves a work of literary art unless it has endeared itself to many minds and found an echo in the popular feeling. Not only have Persia and Khorasan been scourged since then with fire and sword, in which the frail life of manuscripts must have been in constant danger, but the outspoken heterodoxy of the Rubaiyat must have rendered them especially liable to the hostile pursuit of the Moslem church. That they have, trifles as we may think them, been preserved amid all these dangers to furnish themes of enjoyment and of discussion in a state of society so unlike that in which they were born and in which they lived so long raises them to a position of almost scriptural dignity and at last we behold them inspiring modern artists in the busiest centres of western life it was not at all likely that in their original amorphous state they would have pleased the generality of english readers Mr. Winfield has prefixed to his translation this somewhat disparaging motto from Mr. Arnold. A mind, not wholly clear nor wholly blind, too keen to rest, too weak to find. Fitzgerald's Version and the Original Modern Europeans do not care to be troubled with reading that travails soar and brings forth wind. For the use of such, it is more than probable that Fitzgerald's genius and skill have raised the only acceptable structure. Nevertheless, a sympathetic student of human history may be willing to cast a glance at the remote original, too far away in place and time, too bare and open for permanent sojourn, a grotesque nook abounding in quaint arabesque and coloured fretwork, yet none the less a shrine of undogmatic grace and harmlessness and peace. End of section Section 7 of A Second Rubiat Miscellany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Translations from Omar Khayyam by Frank Siller. Mr. Frank Siller of Milwaukee is favorably known both in Germany and the United States as a poet. His translation of Longfellow's Evangeline into German hexameters very greatly pleased the old poet himself and has, since its first publication in 1879, taken its place in German literature as a classic. It is used in the University of Berlin as the best version of that poem. Many other admirable translations from English into German, and from German into English verse, have proceeded from his pen, and a few years ago he collected into a volume a representative selection of his poetry under the title The Song of Manitoba and Other Poems which was published by the T.S. Gray Company of Milwaukee, 1888. It is now, unfortunately, out of print. The late Friedrich Bodenstedt, in the winter of 1880 to 1881, both before and after his visit to California, visited Milwaukee and Mr. Siller, at whose house he stayed, using his German explanation of the Persian original, as well as the manuscript of his complete translation of the Rubaiyat, made an English version of a baker's dozen of them, which were published in the Literary World for February 26th, 1881, Volume 12, page 71. The same also appear in Mr. Siller's volume of poems. He has been kind enough to copy these 13 stanzas for me and to permit me to reproduce them. A potter near his modest cot was shaping many an urn and pot, he took the clay for the earthen things from beggars' feet and heads of kings. Know ye why the cypress tree as freedom's tree is known? Know ye why the lily fair as freedom's flower is shown? Hundred arms the cypress has, yet never plunder seeks. With ten well-developed tongues the lily never speaks. With mine own heart I am in constant strife. What shall I do? Remembrance of past errors blights my life. What shall I do? Though kindly thou, O Lord, my sins forgivest, their memory still within my heart is rife. What shall I do? Like wind flies time between life and death. Therefore, as long as thou hast breath, of care for two days hold thee free, the day that was, 
and is to be. No fear have I of life nor death, that dreaded flight of soul and breath, but not to do my duty here and die shall be my constant fear. Attempt not to fathom the secrets of heaven, but gratefully use what to thee is here given, for none have returned from that realm of bliss to tell how those fared who have prayed much in this. I doubt whether those who through every clime have wandered and sought, in peace and in strife, for gold and for treasures, have ever found time to study the genuine value of life. Many of our leading men are rotten cores in glittering shells. Wealth, position may be theirs, but in their hearts no comfort dwells. So perverted are they oft that only those they can respect, who like them, for sordid causes, all the higher aims neglect. Tomorrow's fate, though thou be wise, thou canst not tell, nor yet surmise. Pass therefore not to-day in vain, for it will never come again. The prophet's followers seek Kaaba shrine, bells call the Christian host in prayer to join. Cross, rosary, and pulpit will I praise, if they but prove safe guides to truth divine. The heart that has no power of self-denial severely suffers, suffers many a trial. The unselfish heart feels bliss without alloy, in causing others happiness and joy. The world will turn when we are earth, as though we had not come nor gone. There was no lack before our birth. When we are gone, there will be none. Friend, believe of dogmas only such as lift the soul to God. If thy neighbour should be needy, go, alleviate his lot. Shun deceit, be just and kind, and cause no fellow being pain. Then wilt thou contentment hear, hereafter, life eternal gain. End of section Section 8 of A Second Rubiat Miscellany This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omar Khayyam From Flowers from Persian Poets, Volume 1 By Nathan Haskell Dole and Bell Walker there's probably no Persian poet so well known today as this so-called Eastern Voltaire, and that he should here occupy the place usually assigned to Anwadi simply demonstrates Omar's own philosophy that no one of us knows of how little importance we are after all. In spite, however, of this philosophy, Omar, in the last half-century, owing to Fitzgerald's matchless translation, has been read from east to west. Even in the rocky mountains of America, a frontiersman, born and bred in that region, was heard to quote the following verse. "'Tis but a tent where takes his one day's rest, a sultan to the realm of death addressed. The sultan rises, and the dark farash strikes, and prepares it for another guest. Gias Uddin Abul Fath Umar bin Ibrahim, better known as Umar Khayyam, was born at Naishapur, and caught a son, somewhere between 1017 and 1050, and he certainly lived into the 12th century. The only story of his boyhood is the following, which is probably legendary. Omar had two intimate school friends. These young men, while studying at Naishapur, each promised the other that if, in after years, any one of them became famous, he would share his prosperity with his less fortunate friends. Years rolled on. One of them did become famous, Nizam ul Mulk, becoming Prime Minister to Sultan Alp Ashlan, and, faithful to his promise, he gave a government position to his friend Hassan ben Sabah, who later tried to supplant his benefactor, but was unsuccessful and was publicly disgraced, after which he became the head of a set of Persian fanatics called Ismailians, who, under his evil chieftainship, were the terror of the early crusaders. He was known as the chief of the assassins. Ultimately, one of the countless victims of the assassin's dagger was Nizam ul Mulk, the old schoolboy friend. And what was Nizam ul Mulk's gift to Omar? A pension that he might have solitude. It was all the poet asked, 
solitude in which to devote his time to mathematics, astronomy, and poetry. His Arabic treatise on algebra has been translated into French, and Gibbon says of the calendar, which he and seven of his mathematical contemporaries worked out, that it is a computation of time which surpasses the Julian and approaches the accuracy of the Gregorian style. Nevertheless, it never went into effect. Omar had the oriental love for roses, and he is reported to have said, My tomb shall be in a spot where the north wind may scatter roses over it. And it was, for one of his pupils tells us that, years after, when I chanced to visit Naishapur, I went to his final resting place, and lo, it was just outside a garden, and trees laden with fruit stretched their boughs over the garden wall, and dropped their flowers upon his tomb, so that the stone was hidden under them. Omar took his Takalis, or poetical name, of Kayam, which means tent-maker, from this trade, which he, or his father, is said to have at one time followed. This Persian custom of taking a Takalis is adopted by almost all of these poets, because they introduce their name into their gazelles or poems, usually toward the end. And, as the proper name seldom sounds well in verse, they choose a desirable one. The Sufis, a sect two centuries old at this time, claim this philosopher as one of them, although during Omar's lifetime they feared his ridicule and hated his honesty, which scorned to disguise his doubts under their veil of mysticism. Indeed, Omar says, If I myself, upon a looser creed, have loosely strung the jewel of good deed, let this one thing for my atonement plead, that one for two I never did misread. Still his countrymen find, in his epigrammic verses, an esoteric meaning he never meant. The Sufis interpret their Persian poets very much as the songs of Solomon have been interpreted by the Christians. But Omar's scepticism was real enough. He belonged to the age of religious darkness in which he lived. Christianity to him meant the Crusades. He, like Hafez, sang of woman, wine and song. But he also pulled hard at the knotted threads of life which taught him this. And this I know, whether the one true light kindled to love or wrath consume me quite, one flash of it within the tavern court better than in the temple lost outright. His idea of contentment we find in the following, as rendered by Emerson. On earth's wide thoroughfares below, two only men contented go, who knows what's right and what's forbid, and he from whom is knowledge hid. Westerners seem almost jealous for this Oriental. They resent the fact that a narrow eastern province should claim this astronomer poet as belonging exclusively to itself. They say, he belongs to the world. Certainly reparation has been made to Omar and his famous translator, Fitzgerald, since the days when a discouraged bookseller in London threw the bulk of the first edition into a box outside his shop to sell for a penny apiece. Here they were found by Rossetti and Swinburne, and now copies of this first edition cannot be bought for a hundred dollars. From such obscurity this eastern singer has risen into a positive cult, with an Omar Khayyam club in London, organised in 1892, and one recently started in Boston, called the Omar Khayyam Club of America. When one glances at the list of translators of this Persian genius, and also the different editions of his Rubaiyat, one can appreciate how true it seems that there's not a sage but has gone mad for thee. Selections from the Rubaiyat An anonymous translation, but accredited to E. A. Johnson. 1. The sun has cast on wall and roof his net of burning light. The lordly day fills high the cup to speed the parting night. Wake! cries in silver accents the herald of the dawn. Arise and drink, the darkness flies, the morning rises bright. 2. The rosy dawn shines through the tavern door and cries, Wake, slumbering reveller, and pour, for ere my sands of life be all run out, I fain would fill my jars with wine once more. 3. 
tomorrow rank and fame for none may be so for to-day thy weary soul set free drink with me love once more beneath the moon she oft may shine again but not on thee and me four if wine and song there be to give thee soul entrancing bliss if there be spots where verdant fields and purling brooklets kiss ask thou no more from providence nor turn thee in despair if there be any paradise for man tis even this five thy ruby lip pours fragrance unto mine thine eyes deep chalice bids me drink thy soul as yonder crystal goblet brims with wine so in thy tear the heart's full tide doth roll six what reck we that our sands run out in bulk or babylon or bitter be the draught or sweet so once the draught is done drink then thy wine with me for many a silver moon shall wax and wane when thou and i are gone seven to those who know the truth what choice of foul or fair where lovers rest though twere in hell for them tis heaven there what wrecks the dervish that he wears sackcloth or satin sheen or lovers that beneath their heads be rocks or pillows fair eight o love chief record of the realms of truth the chiefest couplet in the ode of youth o thou who knowest not the world of love learn this that life is love and love is ruth nine though with the rose and rosy wine i dwell yet time to me no tale of joy doth tell my days have brought no sign of hopes fulfilled tis past the phantoms fly and breaks the spell ten though sweet the rose yet sorely wounds the thorn though deep we drink to-night we rue the morn and though a thousand years were granted say were it not hard to wait the last day's dawn eleven as sweeps the plain the hurrying wind as flows the rippling stream so yesterday from our two lives has passed and is a dream and while i live these to my soul shall bring nor hope nor dread the morrow that may never come the yesterday that fled twelve o oh, joy and solitude of thee well may the poet sing woe worth the heart that owns no soil wherein that flower may spring for when wassail sinks in wailing and traitor friends are gone proudly through vacant hall the sturdy wanderer's step shall ring thirteen if grief be the companion of thy heart brood not o'er thine own sorrows and their smart behold another's woe and learn thereby how small thine own and comfort thy sad heart fourteen o oh, swiftly came the winter wind and swiftly hurried past so madly sought my longing soul the rest she found at last now faint and weak as weakness self she waits but for the end the bowl is broke the wine remains but on the ground is cast fifteen through the unknown life's first dark day my soul did seek the tablet and the pen and paradise and hell then read the teacher from his mystic scroll tablet and pen are in thine hand and so are heaven and hell sixteen hast seen the world all thou hast seen is naught all thou hast said all thou hast heard or wrought sweep the horizon's verge from pole to pole tis vain even all thou hast in secret done is naught seventeen the architect of heaven's blue dome and ruler of the wave in many a grief-laden heart doth deeper plunge the glaive and gathers many a silken tress and many a ruby lip to fill his puppet show the world and his chibouk the grave eighteen though i be formed of water and of clay and with the ills of life content for aye ever thou bidst me shun the joyful cup my hand is empty wherefore bidst me stay nineteen much have i wandered over vale and plain through many climes in joy in grief and pain 
he had never heard men say, The traveller who passed this way has now returned again. 20. Lo, blood of men slain by the stroke of doom. Lo, dust of men strewn on the face of earth. O, oh, take what life may give of youth and mirth, Full many an opening bud shall never bloom. 21. Drink, for thou soon shalt sleep within the tomb, Nor friend nor foe shall break the eternal gloom. Beware, and tell to none his secret dark, The faded rose may never hope to bloom. 22. Fill high the cup, though ache the weary brow, Fill with the wine that doth with life endow, for life is but a tale by watchfire told. Haste thee, the fire burns low, the night grows old. End of section Section 9 of A Second Rubiat Miscellany This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. O Makayam some Verses and an Introduction by W. E. B. Whittaker and Rex Lowenberg Chester, Philipson and Golder, 1907 This edition has 53 quatrains, printed on one side of the leaf only, and is limited to six sets. There is a dedication, A Deux Amis, F. E. M. Part 1. Introduction Omar Khayyam it is now a matter of no little difficulty to write an introduction to the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. To each separate edition has been prefixed an introduction telling, in various ways, the same facts concerning his life and works. Every conceivable theological point has been discussed with more or less amplitude. Condemnations and appreciations have come forth by the score, and no new light is shed either on the dim outline of his life or the philosophic value of his work and it is hopeless for one not thoroughly steeped in eastern imagery history and tradition to do more than give briefly the sum of his own opinions in regard to the said verses it is therefore not the intention of the present writers to do more than that the few events in omar's life have become familiar to such of the public as are attracted by the subtle versification of the master of moods through the essay prefixed by mr fitzgerald to his edition of the rubaiyat it is a matter of doubt whether omar's life can have been eventful to any extent he was more famous for the thoughts he had not expressed on paper than for those he had despite the lingering and wistful haunting beauty of the latter he had no ambition as it is now understood neither did he care to move the world through the medium of politics his joy was peace the religious aspect of omar's works is the most important factor in moralists judgment of the value of his verse they read into it what is not there and fail to see what is there they see the selfishness the cynicism the contempt and the licentious strain and pass over the sorrow the warm-hearted friendship the unforgetting memory, the resignation, and the aesthetic beauty of the life. Omar was the prince of hedonists. Pleasure was his religion and his life, his work and his play. His creed was simple and beautiful. To speak of the pursuit of pleasure without a qualifying sense of disapproval is, in this modern England, a serious offence to many who still adhere to a puritanically hypocritical view of what they are pleased to call life. Yet surely the pursuit of pleasure is not without its virtues. When a hedonist sees poverty, it naturally jars on his refined artistic sense, and, if he be true to his creed, he will endeavour to remove such signs of misery. The beautifying life is to him a sacred duty, self-imposed, and with its own reward. Each little act of the common day carries with it an artistic sense of grace. Convention is regarded only so far as it conveys an aesthetic value in its rules, and is cast aside when it hampers and destroys the beauty of living. Hedonism is what people name the simple life. In it, 
There is no discordant note and no pain. Here and there comes an act or a thought which appears superficially to be a breach of its smooth comeliness, but which is really a purposeful effort to break, by vivid contrast, what might otherwise degenerate into a cloying, oversweet monotony. Omar lived the simple life. His creed was simple. Here is the creed of Omar. I believe in wine and roses. Also I believe in woman. What a foolish thing to do. And in the God that made them, I believe. Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam by Richard Le Gallienne. Wine, to softly fill his mind with magic scenes of beauty, pictures of roseate futures and hidden possibilities where no sorrow would be, and pain would only exist as a foil to increase the ecstatic sensations of joy. Woman to soothe him in his sorrows, to recreate them, and to smooth care away again. Girls were his handmaidens and his queens, his pleasure and hate, all things to all moods. A fair oval face with great round soft eyes and pleading lips hovered in his mind at all times and dictated his every action. God he thought of as one all kindness, who would never, in a fit of after rage, destroy even the faulty vessel he had condemned to a brief existence on his earth. In no place can one discover even a faint trace of doubt as to the final forgiveness of the Lord of all. To Omar, God was what he is not to the great majority, a friend to be trusted in silence and to be left free from vain and querulous importunings. His greatest charm was at the same time his greatest fault, his power was confined to the delicate definition of certain moods of youth. If life were a series of moods, then Omar had mastered the secret of life, but moods are rather the interludes in a life than its foundation. To introspective youth, sorrow is the subtlest form of pleasure, though they know it not. Youth finds, at times, a curious joy in sad reveries of past days, of faded flowers and lost kisses, and in musing glimpses of a future, with its promise of fame and pleasure, blended with a certain self-conscious self-sacrifice. One is so ready to look forward to a career of sorrow when one is young. It seems so noble, so poetical, so unusual. But age brings with it disillusion and the painful discovery that the world is not impressed by a conscious affectation of sadness and romantic melancholy. The world merely looks and passes on with the words, It will pass away. He is young yet. And when one is old, and consequently wise and virtuous, one thinks and says the same. Omar, on the contrary, was a young man all his life. Through all his days he gazed and smiled on the ways of the world without change. About conventional religion he was gently satirical. About ambition rather dubious, and about fame he was careless. Women and wine he considered as means to an end. His prevailing thought was of the mutability of human life. He could not drink without thinking that the cup would soon be empty. He could not be happy with a friend because of the inevitable parting. There is no day without its faded flower, nor any joy without its closing hour. This cup of wine, which joyfully you raise, itself will emptied be for all your power. It is said that when Omar was young, he for many days suffered torments of doubt about his future. He had great friends who would have helped him if his ambition led in the direction of politics. He had others who would aid him as a merchant. Should he sacrifice his ideals as a poet and the dim possibility of eternal fame and accept the certainty of worldly wealth and position? He knew not, and there was none to help him. At sunset, on a hot summer's day, Omar lay on the flower-strewn banks of a softly flowing river. Through the sultry hours of the day he had lain and thought of the future, and now, overcome by the weariness of prolonged mental debate, he fell asleep, and he dreamed of a fair green country, and the sound of soft music filled his ears. Before him were gates of gold and ivory, which fell open as he watched. 
From their portals came a young girl clothed in white, with a girdle of precious stones. Her glorious hair, dark as the caverns of the night, flowed freely and gracefully over the lithe beauty of her body. A crown of crimson roses was on her head, and a garland of roses fell from her shoulders. In either hand she held a pomegranate. Swiftly she came to him and gazed on him sadly, with a gentle look in her great eyes. After a space she said, Omar, the tent-maker, I am sent to thee to bid thee make thy choice. I bear in my hands two pomegranates, the one ripe and full of joy, the other green and as yet sour. The first, over-rich, will the sooner die and leave no seed. The second will mature slowly and spread seed on the face of the earth. The first is called wealth and the second poetry. Choose. And he chose the unripe fruit. The maiden knelt and kissed him, and he awoke to find a rose-leaf fluttering from his lips. But that dream decided the course of his life. Henceforth, without fail, he would desert the world and find pleasure at the riverside with flowers and girls. And so, for the remainder of his earthly existence, he lived at Neshapur with a flask of wine, a book of verse, and his little moon. His schoolfellows rose to rank and power, and did not forget him, yet from them he took nothing. His fame as a teacher spread into many lands, yet he did not influence the smooth passage of his life. Day after day, his magic thought added ruby after ruby to his book of verse, and hour after hour his lot became fairer. Yet, at times, even with Omar, pleasure palled, and life became empty. On such a day he said to a disciple, Many times as the sun rises on a new day, I long for a poison so subtle that I might pass over into the garden of dreams in a peaceful sleep, without pain and without sorrow, without regret and without envy, with a hope of endless sleep among the lilies and roses of that mystic world of dreams. And then, if in life I failed to attain, in death I should achieve my heart's desire. What are happiness and love, beauty and wealth, health and hope? Dreams, dreams, dreams. And I myself am a spirit unreal in a world of unreality. But such moods were only momentary. They departed with a cup of wine or a smile from some loved one. Years before his death, he had hoped that his body might lie in a pleasant place with roses growing wild over his tomb. Ah, with the grape my fading life provide, and wash my body whence the life has died, and in a winding sheet of vine leaf wrapped, so bury me by some sweet garden side, that even my buried ashes such a snare of perfume shall fling up into the air, as not a true believer passing by, but shall be overtaken unaware. Fitzgerald he died at Neshapur in A.D. 1123, and still the wild roses bloom over his lonely grave. The flowers, sustained by the ashes of his mortal body, still hold the attention of the passer-by, while the immortal flowers of his imagination hold, and will ever hold, the world in thrall. The authors have endeavoured, as far as possible, to reproduce in the English metre made popular by the genius of Mr. Fitzgerald, such quatrains of the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam as have not previously been rendered in English verse. They have no knowledge of Persian, and are therefore unhampered by any pedantic restriction of the freedom of translation. They have endeavoured to convey the spirit of his work, if not always the form. There is no strict sequence in the arrangement of the quatrains. Omar's moods, succeeding one to the other, with the breathless rapidity of changing thoughts in the mind of a girl. End of section. Section ten of a second Rubaiyat Miscellany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. O Khayyam, some verses and an introduction by W. E. B. Whittaker and Rex Lowenberg. 
Part two Quatrains One The waking sun has touched the sky with gold, and dawn her wondrous vision has unrolled. Ah, haste to drink, while yet thou hast the time, before that last long night doth thee enfold. Two To you, who now with faces sore downcast, Wander a while where merchants barter fast. A girl will bring, with footsteps soft and swift, A future fair, with flower and maid, at last. 3. Of all earth's secrets I have learnt but one, That sorrow never dies when sets the sun. Yea, this is all the wisdom I have found, And soon my days of learning will be done. 4. Why should our lives be now so much perplexed With thinking of this world and of the next? Life's little tale will far too soon be told That we should weary it with vain pretext. 5. For not a star that burneth now on high Shall cease to glitter when we too shall die. The sun its never-ending course will keep And still the moon will brighten in the sky. 6. Ah! Heart, my heart, the day draws near to night, And soon thou shalt be taken from my sight. O oh, sorry fate, that we so soon must part, And I must stay and mourn my lost delight. 7. What if the Sufi's ceaseless prate be true? What if a god some day shall judge us too? But why should I my idle brain perplex, Beloved? Have I not both wine and you? 8. Then fill the cup before the dying day, Shall take my sorrows and my joys away, And hope that when my years have ceased to be, Some potter may make wine cups from my clay. 9. Drunken am I, yet quickly tell me, friend, Did God himself a message to you send? Did he himself point out to you the way on which my wandering footsteps I should bend? 10. With strange features has my life been made, and through strange evils has its path been laid. Yet how may I be better than I am, for as God made me, I have ever stayed? 11. All broken lie those promises of mine, long since forgotten in the lovely vine. Well, let them go. Twere better far I broke an hundred promises than one fair jar of wine. 12. Sages have sifted all this world of dust and found that naught is certain save the dust. But here are faces fair and rosy wine. Why vex your mind with thinking of the dust? 13. Why ceaseless argue of the five and four what matter if there be ten thousand more? Will one be easier then to understand? Ah, leave these dreams, and seek the tavern door. 14. Within the cup there is such magic grace, That drinking I may see my loved one's face, And so my many sorrows I may lose, And in my dreaming find some short solace. 15. I drink of wine, and yet I do no sin, Happy am I when once the room within. And if you ask me why I worship wine, Is not thine own self-worship greater sin? 16. For when my soul I drench with ruby wine, Before my eyes there comes a dream divine, Within mine ears sweet music ever plays, Shall I leave these for that sad world of thine? 17. The nightingale is singing on the tree, the roses send a breath of joy to me. Leave those sad shadows of the idle past, and take the joy of what we still may see. 18. Close to the river blooms a garden fair. What sweeter heaven may I find than there? What happier hours than those that I now spend, watching the sunlight rippling on thy hair? 19. Why shouldst thou vanish with the closing day, Canst thou not spare a little time to stay? For lo, the angel hovers overhead, And soon shall come to take us twain away. 20. As I am now this picture once has been, Who knows what splendid lovers it has seen? 
Perchance the very handle that I hold Has clasped the throat of some forgotten queen. 21. Then take the cup, and so let all thy fears Be drowned in it, and mingled with thy tears. Who knows this clay that now is me May build a tavern wall in after years. 22. Ah, heart! My heart, how splendid falls the night, Within her mantle holding strange delight. Let naught of earth this silent hour come nigh, Let naught save wine be brought into my sight. 23. Silver and gold and ivory they bring, Praises of God and future joy they sing. Yet while with me I have both wine and you, Their bribes will I upon the desert fling. 24. Life to my lips once held a cup of wine, and deep I drank, deeming it drink divine, but yet the taste was bitter in my mouth, for it was grief, no daughter of the vine. 25. You tell me, friend, my face from wine to turn, lest afterwards in hellfire I shall burn. What if tis true? Does not this moment glad outweigh a future fate which none may learn? 26. If all the world shall burn with sudden fire, yet I will fearlessly of thee inquire, why thou shouldst have ever made this me, if it must perish at thy least desire. 27. Man with a strong desire thou hast endowed, and yet to fill it thou hast not allowed, and so we halt between desire and doubt, fearing to drink, nor yet to faith avowed. 28. Full often, when the stars shine overhead, I lie unsleeping on my restless bed, and think upon the cruelty of him who sets with sins the path whereon we tread. 29. For every breath a sense of sorrow brings, tis in the music that the bulbul sings, tis in the flowers that lie beneath my feet, and even in the palaces of kings. 30. I put my lips to yon fair vessel's brink, and found that twas but sorrow's bitter drink. So took I one long draught of this red wine, that straightway to oblivion I might sink. 31. If in the town thou dost achieve to fame, men think thee sinner, and revile thy name. And if within thy corner thou dost sit, men say then that thou plottest some new shame. 32. Better thy hand with some girl's hair should play Than vex thy brain with visions of the way. Better for thee to drink the vine's red blood, For death shall pour thee his dark wine some day. 33. Why reason if the tale be false or true? The years that are to come are all too few, And when they pass, and I to dust return, What matters it if earth be old or new? 34. Life's little song we know will soon be done. What if the end before this moon be run? Ah, seize the pleasure while you yet have time, for naught save sorrow comes when sets the sun. 35. There is no day without its faded flower, nor any joy without its dying hour. This cup of wine, which joyfully you raise, itself will emptied be for all your power. 36. Seeing this world is neither thine or mine, how foolish I should be to drink no wine! What pity not to see my own heart's love, nor yet my fingers in her hair entwine! 37. O oh, thou, who weepest now for sorrow's pain, raise up thine head, and give one thought again. For save through sorrow thou shalt have no joy, and but through sorrow life can yield no gain. 38. Drink not with all men that by chance you meet. Drink in the tavern, but be silent in the street. And if a wise man poison brings to thee, take it and drink, and drinking, find it sweet. 39. Why sorrow with the griefs and pains of men, and toiling seek for God or heaven, for when the wrapper of thy soul to rags is torn, what matter to thee all thy past sins then? 
40. The soft spring wind has made the roses flower, The bulbul sings the joy of every hour, Then rest beneath the palm tree's pleasant shade, And watch the red rose spread her golden dower. 41. Some see in life naught else save pain and tears, Repeating sorrows and strange changing fears. Come then with me, and I will show you how to live in joy till end the weary years. 42. Queen of my life, the golden sun is setting. The day is done, but there is no forgetting. Night and her stars in silver splendour come. I have thy love, but there is no forgetting. 43. The fresh-born roses bring a breath of spring. The evening winds a breath of pleasure bring. And all the birds that round us quickly fly Bear gladness in the throbbing notes they sing. 44. Some men for ever think this life a dream, And death the great awakening they deem. And when in joy I laugh and love and sing, These subtle thinkers tell me I blaspheme. 45. O oh, dreamer, dream and think of faces fair. O oh, drinker, drain a cup to faces fair. There is so very little time for aught, save subtle thought of transient faces fair. 46. If e'er I drank of joy, and lightly laughed, straightway did sorrow bring her bitter draught. If ever I dipped bread in salt, and ate, it tore my heart as wounds a dagger's shaft. 47. I hold no rose, and yet I have the thorn. I have no light, yet still the fierce flames burn. I have no hope of heaven or afterwards, so still my thoughts unto the cup I turn. 48. My sins are not enough to merit hell, and certainly in heaven I shall not dwell. Then where hereafter shall I go to, say? Is there not one of you wise men can tell? 49. Hast thou not seen a potter with his clay, making his jars and cups from day to day? And if, perchance, he shape one all awry, is it not straightway spurned and cast away? 50. Golden as sunlight is thy splendid hair, slender as cypress is thy body fair, and face more lovely than the waking rose, with you beside me, for naught else I care. 51. Around my feet is spread a field of flowers, showing my heart a vision of glad hours. When roses cast their blossoms all around, what used to me those visionary powers? 52. So while life is, let all your days be glad. Tis only Sufis who are ever sad. Drink, laugh, and sing, and let the grey world go. What matter if those dreamers think us mad? 53. Far through the mists I hear dead voices calling, Shades of the long past years of love's enthralling. They bid me come, and coming sleep in peace. I come, I come! The veil of night is falling. End of section End of A Second Rubiat Miscellany Read by Algie Pug